Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the time that we call for a, for a hearing, 10 a.m. And I am Reverend Ruben Diaz, Councilman Diaz, and the chair of the committee. Before we proceed, I would like to recognize some of my colleagues, none of them are here yet. Today we will be conducting a hearing on the following nine, nine pieces of legislation. By the way, they're telling me that I was supposed to be out of here by 12.30, I doubt it. Uh, there's nine pieces of legislation that we will be discussing today. Intro, intro, one, the first one, introduction 304, is introduced by Council Member Rodriguez. We, we create a task force to study taxi cap medallion values. Intro 1052, it's been introduced by Speaker Johnson, who establish a program that will provide benefits such as health care services and disability insurance to drivers. Intro, intro number 1062, by Council Member Grodenchi, we require taxi and for hire vehicle drivers to be paid the full amount for a trip, regardless of whether a digital payment is denied. Introduction, intro 1068 by Council Member Levine will require TLC to provide financial education to taxi and FHV drivers. Intro 1069, introduced by Council Member Levin, will require the TLC to study the problems associated with medallion owner debts. Intro, intro 1070, by Council Member Moya, we require transparency and other rules in relation to the leasing, rental, and conditional purchase of a higher vehicle. Intro 1079 by Council Member Richards, we create an office of inclusion with TLC. Intro 1081 by Council Member Salamanca, will establish driver assistance center that will provide financial and mental health counseling and referrals to drivers. And finally, intro 1096, which I have sponsored, will require high volume for higher services to affirm that they will not take automatic deduction from driver's earning to make payment for the rental, lease, or purchase of a for hire vehicle. This nine bill, we, the nine bill that we are considering today, build upon the work that we have done recently to bring much needed reform to the for hire vehicles industry in order to level the, play, the playing field and help drivers across the board earn a decent living. I am very proud of the work this committee has done over the last several months and look forward to working with the speaker, my colleagues, colleagues here in the council, the TLC, and all of the, and all of the various stakeholders. I am waiting for the speaker, Johnson, to come up he is he's going to be here today. He is in the what? It's not it's not right yet. Oh, he's coming. Should I wait? Should I wait? Or? He's on the subway. But then, ladies and gentlemen, what the speaker is here, is when he comes here. Uh, I now invite my huh? None of my sponsors are here to deliver their opening remarks, but the commission is here. Commission is here today. 
And I thank Commissioner, the Tax Allegiance Commission, for, for being here today. I'm really, the, do, do we know how, much, how long the speaker will be? Speak, the speaker is five minutes away. Five minutes away? Yes. I'm going to hold the meeting for five minutes until the speaker gets here. He's the boss. So, doing on the Dixon matter? Huh? She's not the only one from the administration. We're going to have testimony from the other agencies that are affected by this. Letter. I'm going to be here until we finish. Uh, of course. I'm not but it's, just, it. it's impossible. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that's how
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will start again the meeting, and today is an honor for me, a pleasure, a privilege to have with us the Speaker of the City Council, the Honorable, the Honorable Corey Johnson, and I now will turn the microphone over to the distinguished Speaker of the City Council. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Diaz. Uh, good morning. Uh, the, Ye the New York City Yellow Cab is iconic. Uh, it's one of the most recognizable symbols of New York City, and for years, the story of that industry was widely one of enormous success. It was a ladder to the middle class for generations of New Yorkers, including many immigrants whose introduction to American life began behind the wheel. If you look at classic old pictures of New York City, chances are you're gonna see yellow cabs. That's how much people associate the taxi industry with this city. But things, of course, have changed rapidly, which is why we are here today. Five years ago, New York City yellow cab medallions were going for over a million dollars at auction, and their rate of return was outperforming Standard & Poor's. That, of course, is not the landscape that we are in today. The industry, which was once dominated by yellow cabs, has been upended, in large part due to app-based cab service companies. There's been explosive growth over the past three years. We've seen 2,000 license applications flood into the TLC every month for month after month now. We had 65,000 for hire vehicles on the city streets in 2015, and today, there are now over 100,000. None of this happened in a vacuum. There, have been, uh, there has been a very human toll that has been exacted by these changes. The people who relied on driving a cab or a black car for their livelihoods found they no longer could. They're swimming in debt, working longer hours for pay, and many of these people are immigrants and many are living in poverty. The American dream has turned into a nightmare for many of them. Most tragic, we've seen some drivers who have taken their own lives. Since November of 2017, we've lost Kenny Chow, Abdul Saleh, Nikanor Ochisor, Douglas Shifter, Daniel Castillo, and Alfredo Perez. I say their names every time I talk about what we as a council are doing to protect drivers because I do not want them to be forgotten. And I don't think I'm alone in saying these six tragedies served as a wake-up call to many of us. The City Council acted. We passed a law placing a pause on the issuance of for hire vehicle license with the important exception of wheelchair accessible vehicles because we want as many of those in the streets as we can get. With that law, we can better examine the changes taking place now while also ensuring all New Yorkers have access to for hire vehicles. We also required the city to set a minimum payment for drivers working for high volume for hire, for hire services. It's the right thing to do, considering all the financial turmoil drivers have been facing. And I'm proud of that work, but I'm also a realist and consider myself an honest broker. So I can say here today that what we did wasn't enough. Our work is not done. And that's what today's hearing is about. There are still issues that we need to address in the for hire vehicle industry. Many drivers in the city are working without health benefits. 16% of drivers have no health benefits. 40% of drivers have income so low that they qualify for Medicaid. So I think we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough to protect these workers? Many of them work more than 40 hours a week in an industry that we count on to move people around the city. The answer to me is clear. We need to find a way to make sure drivers have health care and the benefits that they deserve. One of the bills that we're going to hear today, one that I introduced, Introduction 1052, <clears throat> would create a health benefits fund for drivers to address that need. We also still need to address how drivers are struggling to make ends meet 
This is a relatively new development and it is serious. We don't want people's lives to become so hard they feel boxed in and they end up taking their own life. It is important to offer a helping hand where we can, which is why uh, the bills introduced by Council Members Levin and Salamanca aim to do just that. One, uh, Council Member Levin's bill introduction 1068 would require city agencies to provide drivers with financial education on medallion purchases. And in the case of yellow cabs and car purchases, uh, leases and rentals, and in the case of app-based companies and black cars. The other introduction 1081 from Councilmember Salamanca would require the TLC to provide financial counseling and mental health services to drivers. We'll also be hearing about several other bills today. All of them are aimed at making the for hire vehicle industry a more fair and more transparent industry for everyone involved. Given what we've seen in the past year, I urge everyone to keep in mind how difficult it has been for so many people working in the industry. We should all keep that central in our discussion about what changes can and should be made to these bills. I want to thank uh, the chair, Reverend uh, Ruben Diaz Sr. for holding this hearing today and for the partnership that we had together in passing the previous series of bills, which I think were very, very important. Uh, I want to thank the staff and I want to thank the council here, Christopher Lynn, um, and I look forward to continuing to ensure that drivers are protected in New York City, and I look forward to doing that uh, together. I'm very happy to see uh, the commissioner here today who has done such a great job. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker, I would like to express my appreciation for all the things that you have done since you became speaker. You created this committee and you have given uh, this committee all the tools necessary to work and to do for the driver, for the industry, things that before were not done. And you have shown your interest, and your commitment, and your uh, human, humanity for this industry and for the, especially for the drivers. And I appreciate you appointing me chairman. And we have done in the last, in the past eight, nine months, we have done things that were incredible. And today we have nine bills and we will continue and you have opened the door for every single council member to feel free to, to do things for the driver, for the industry. And today is an indication of that. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for being here today. And again, thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to remind you of those words moving forward. <laughs> okay, now today, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if one of my colleagues are here, with one of them, with, this, with the, none of the sponsors are here today. So I would like to open what I have today, Council Member Ballon and Council Member Lander. Okay, and I'm going to call now on the commissioner, um, Mary Josie, uh, the, the, the honorable commissioner of the Taxi and Limousine uh, Commission, and I appreciate her being here today. Good morning, commissioner. Thank you for being here. And please. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Diaz um, and the count Speaker Johnson, Council Member Lander, Rodriguez, and Valone. Uh, thank you very much for being here in what I think is a, an extremely important hearing, and I'll give you a spoiler alert. We heartily support all of the bills. So <clears throat> I want to just give you a few details of why. Intros 1068 and 1081 would require the city to provide additional counseling and support to drivers and potential drivers. Intro 1068 would require TLC in consultation with the Department of Consumer Affairs and other agencies to engage in outreach and education to people considering purchasing or leasing a for hire or a taxi medallion. 
outreach and education materials would describe the common terms involved in vehicle and medallion transactions and be translated into most spoken languages. Drivers would be given access to counseling intended to help people understand these terms. TLC agrees with the council that it is crucial that current and potential drivers and owners fully understand the costs associated with working in their respective industries. In support of this mission, TLC already partners with DCA's Office of Financial Empowerment to distribute materials and help existing owners and drivers book appointments with financial empowerment centers. We also promote OFE offerings in our TLC newsletter, Keys to the City, and we've created different education materials for current and potential FHV and medallion drivers to break down all of the expected or assumed costs for driving and or owning an FHV or yellow taxi. Additionally, our driver protection unit helps drivers by providing agency attorneys to assist them with predatory or illegal leasing arrangements or other financial disputes. We look forward to continuing our partnership with DCA and expanding our financial education outreach. And I'll note many of the flyers that I'm talking about, um, I've brought copies of here, so please feel free to take them. Um, intro 1081 would require TLC to establish driver assistance centers to provide services and information for drivers and vehicle owners, including information on mental health services and referrals. On a daily basis, TLC conducts this crucial driver outreach through our external affairs team, which handles emails and calls from drivers daily, in addition to many driver cases referred by elected officials. As you know, Chair Diaz, members of this team have worked closely with your legislative assistant, Jenny Mejia, to help over 300 drivers understand the TLC process and regulations. And this work is only one component of a citywide outreach strategy meant to reach as many drivers as possible whenever they have questions or concerns. TLC goes into the community to meet with drivers at events organized by other agencies such as small business services and community affairs. And we organize our own driver events citywide, which have been branded TLC in your borough where we coordinate with local community and driver groups to maximize turnout and driver outreach. TLC has hosted events in all five boroughs, frequently in neighborhoods populated with many drivers or at religious centers frequented by drivers. Our next TLC in your borough event will be at the Bronx Lebanon Hospital on September 25th. We work closely with Thrive NYC to increase awareness among drivers. Our external affairs, enforcement, and licensing teams, that's almost 250 people, have all received mental health first aid training from Thrive NYC. And we provide information about the city's mental health resources directly to our licensees at all our events as well as well as in our monthly newsletter. So far, we have co-hosted four events with Thrive, and on September 21st, we'll begin monthly meetings at Houses of Worship with a meeting at the Bangladeshi Muslim Center in Kensington. We're excited to continue this partnership to reach as many drivers in need of these services as possible. TLC supports these bills and applauds Council's recognition of the importance of a strong and substantive outreach targeted to drivers' needs. Intro 1052 would require TLC to study the feasibility and cost of providing certain benefits for drivers, including medical care, mental health care, vision, disability insurance, sick and sick pay, and to recommend to the speaker which benefits should be offered. The bill would also require TLC to establish a program to administer those benefits. <clears throat> After determining the overall program costs and determining how to fund such a program, TLC supports the goal of providing benefits to the city's hardworking TLC licensed drivers. As you may know, five years ago, the TLC established a driver benefit fund for the same reasons the council is considering one today. The fund was struck down because a court found that its creation exceeded our agency's jurisdiction. And although there are certainly complex federal and state laws relating to health care that need to be considered, today's bill addresses that challenge to our jurisdiction. And we're excited to restart the efforts to bring health care services to drivers. 
Today, there are over 180,000 drivers. So the effort to determine how best to structure that benefit fund for all of them will be very different from what it was in 2012 and take considerable time, more than is currently allotted in the bill. It will also require expertise that is beyond the TLCs, and we look forward to working with Council on a timeline to ensure a comprehensive study and partnering with our sister agencies with the next necessary expertise and experience. Intro 1062 would provide, protect drivers against being charged when a passenger credit card transaction fail, so-called chargeback. In the event of such a failure, base technology systems providers, agents, or medallion owners must cover any charges, and there is a penalty of 250 to 500 for each offense. We agree that drivers should not bear the burden of technology errors over which they have no control, and we support the intent of the bill. Intro 304 and 1069 focus on the current state of medallion owners, so I want to highlight for some context, the steps TLC and the City Council have taken. City Council created one universal TLC driver's license, so drivers can more easily move between sectors, and this has enhanced earning potential and widened the pool of drivers for both sectors. TLC recently approved the Flex Fare pilot that allows taxi apps to quote an upfront fare to passengers this gives taxi passengers the same benefit that for hire vehicle passengers have, ease of smartphone hailing, access to upfront pricing, and seamless payment. TLC has extended vehicle retirement periods for taxis and significantly expanded the pool of vehicles that can be used as a taxi cab. Additionally, TLC Pilot allows taxi owners to lease to drivers on a commission basis rather than a fixed lease at lease payment. TLC is eliminated the owner must drive requirement so that independent medallion owners have greater flexibility to drive. The council eliminated the distinction between the independent and corporate medallion and also lowered the transferred tax from 5% to 0.5% to reduce expenses associated with medallion transactions. And this year, TLC launched Citywide Accessible Dispatch, which allows taxi drivers to receive not only the metered fare for the trip, but also dispatch payments to compensate for time spent traveling to the pickup point and assisting passengers. We continue to work with the MTA as they experiment using taxis for Accessoride, and these are the, some of the steps that we've taken to support the medallion industry. Intro 304 would establish a tax force to study taxicab medallion values and the impact of taxi medallion sales on the city's budget, and within six months make recommendations to increase the value of taxi medallions. We support the effort, as I've testified before, on Intro 304, which was numbered Intro 963 in the previous session, and as I said last year, TLC always supports developing new ideas to help our licensees, and we're interested in hearing new proposals for additional steps the city might take. Intro 1069 would require TLC in consultation with the Department of Finance to study the problem of medallion owners with excessive debt due to the decline in medallion values. The bill would require the study to be completed by June 1, 2019, after which the TLC would consider the findings and determine any appropriate actions, which may include identifying organizations that may offer assistance, including financial assistance to medallion owners. Unfortunately, the city's access to information about the extent of a medallion debt is limited, and this may hamper review of these issues, and the interplay of state and federal finance laws may limit the tools the city can employ to address challenges associated with medallion debt. So we will continue to work closely with the council to determine the most effective way to review these issues and support owners. Intro 1070 would require TLC to promulgate rules regarding for hire vehicle leasing, rental, lease to own, and conditional purchase agreements. TLC would be required to consider mandatory disclosure requirements, consumer protection practices, and setting caps on the amounts payable under these agreements, for example, deposits. 
We also support the financing limits proposed in Intro 1070, as we've long recognized the need for protections in this area, and since 2012, we have regulated the conditional purchase of a taxi vehicle. The city has jurisdiction over vehicle leases to drivers when the individual or company leasing the vehicle is licensed by the TLC. What we cannot currently do is regulate the entity that's not licensed by us and that provides vehicles and financing for TLC vehicles. So we'd like to explore with Council how Intro 1070 could be amended to grant the city that express authority. Another approach may be to requ a requirement that only vehicles that are financed according to specific criteria may be licensed by the TLC. We support the need for greater transparency in FHV leasing. With the large expansion of the FHV market, leases have taken on a greater importance for drivers, most of whom buy or lease their vehicles, often at a high interest rate. TLC fully supports shedding more light on these agreements so that drivers better understand the risks of leasing or purchasing. TLC has proposed transparency rules for an October 3rd hearing that will require several new protections, including that FHV leases be written in plain language and that they specify all costs to drivers, the key lease terms be disclosed written in plain language, and that bases provide drivers with an itemized breakdown of how much a driver earned, the amount of a passenger fare, and driver expenses. Intro 1096, which we received a few days ago, would amend Section 19548 of the Administrative Code. It was enacted last month and creates a new category, the high volume for hire service category. The proposed legislation would require those companies to affirm in their license application that they will not charge or deduct from for hire owners or drivers automatic payments for the rental, lease, or purchase of a vehicle. We support the transparency goal of Intro 1096, and we look forward to hearing input about automatic deductions from the drivers, many of whom are here today. Intro 1079 would create an Office of Inclusion to address the problem of service refusals. Service refusals are illegal and unacceptable. Every passenger has the right to service, regardless of race, ethnicity, disability, gender, or sexual orientation. And we take refusal complaints very seriously. Our prosecution unit investigates them fully and the drivers face significant fines and revocation for service refusals. We encourage passengers to report through 311 or TLC. And when an FHV passenger complains only to the company and not the TLC, there's no way for the city to track the complaints or hold the driver accountable. Service refusal complaints are heard at oath and the passengers can participate in the hearing by phone and about 90% of them do. Potential fines range from $350 to $1,000 in revocation. And since January 2017, we've received about 3,500 service refusal complaints and about 65% of these have ended up in a pro conviction. Over the last year, TLCs met with the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund in New York City about race-based service refusals, and we've incorporated many of their suggestions into our work. We've held extensive discussion groups with drivers, faith leaders, and community leaders about ending service refusals. These discussions significantly shaped the short film that TLC is making with NYC Media featuring journalist Errol Lewis which we will use for driver education and additional outreach. Over the last summer, our social media advertising campaign led to more than 32,000 people in predominantly African-American zip codes clicking on a city website to learn how to file a service refusal. We anticipate the Office of Inclusion building upon and expanding prosecution, enforcement, education, and outreach work that the TLC does in this area, and we appreciate the City Council's support for this critical work. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share TLC's views today. Thank you, Commissioners. I would like to express my appreciation, my thanks for the support you have given my office to Jenny Mejias in helping us solve so many problems of, those, of drivers that before they, used, they have to pay someone to go and 
work for them now in the office, they could come and there's a free service and your office have been very, very open and very helpful in, in, in helping the drivers. And Jenny Mejia from my office has been there every day from nine to five for five days. Now I'm gonna allow the speaker, the honorable speaker Johnson, if he has any question or any remarks. Uh, no, I don't have any. <clears throat> I don't have any questions, but I, I really want to thank you, Commissioner. I think, again, as I said in my opening statement, I think you've done a fantastic job, and the partnership between uh, the council and the TLC in the package of bills we were able to pass uh, in August was uh, tremendous. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that you and your staff have done on a very, again, complicated uh, look at things. Uh, and this new package of bills that we're hearing today are things that we think continue the step in the right direction. So I look forward to a continued partnership and uh, cooperation together and, and figuring out how to best move forward to continue to look at a rapidly changing industry and continue to protect drivers all across the entire industry. Um, so I, I don't wanna uh, take up time today. There are members who are here who have questions. I'm particularly excited about the Health Benefit Fund, which as you mentioned in your uh, opening statement and testimony that uh, this was something the TLC tried to do on its own, but a judge ruled that there needed to be legislative action. And so Councilmember Lander and I have been working on this a bill for a few years now, and we're really grateful that the bill is being heard today, and we look forward to working with you and your team to bring uh, health coverage to as many drivers as possible. So again, I wanna thank you, Commissioner, for everything you've done, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also would like to recognize that Council Member Rodriguez and Borelli are joining us today. Commissioner, I have a question. Uh, a few months ago, this city council uh, approved introduction 838. How much money does the TLC need to, proce to process data in order to implement the provisions in that law? Um. You're referring to the creation of the high volume for higher vehicle category? I believe so. Okay. Um, so yes, that will take uh, additional funds because there's additional analysis that's involved in determining whether to issue a license and under what conditions. Uh, we're in the process of f determining what exactly the scope of that will be, um, but we've in discussions with OMB and I'm confident we'll get the resources that we need. In August 14, 20, this year, the mayor signed five bills into law. Three of them require that the TLC issue regulations. And as of today, where are you with this? How are we doing? It was August 14th. Today's September 17th. Yeah. Um, so some of the regulations we were asked to uh, promulgate have to be preceded by a study. So that is um, one st a study that's a year-long study that's underway. So we can't promulgate those regulations until the study's complete. On driver pay, we proposed and published those regulations some two to three weeks ago. There's a hearing on October 3rd on the driver pay regulations. Commissioner, do you believe that, that it, is a, it is the job of the TSC to protect the value of taxi medallion? Uh, as it is in this state in the city charter? The job of the TLC is to ensure service, and taxis represent the only sector that provides publicly available, hailable, and, and accessible, um, although the FHV industry is going to be catching up, service. And that service that can be provided to people, whether they have a credit card or not, whether they have a smartphone or not, and in making sure that that service is available, we have an interest in making sure that there is an economic model that works so that drivers and owners are out on the streets providing service. What advice or how do you think the, the city should do, that we should do, or the city, uh, how should we do, should, uh, how should the city 
act to raise the value of medallions? Uh, the bill contemplates uh, consultation with the Department of Finance, and I think that is the exact right direction because of the things the TLC monitors on a daily basis, it doesn't include financial investments and some of the ways to improve them or to tackle things like um, debt. So I look forward to getting the input of the experts in the, that area, the Department of Finance, uh, to answer out questions just like what you've posed. I want, I'm, I'm going to switch to the to, to introduction 1052, the health benefit bill. Uh, is health insurance a compelling need for taxi medallion owner, owners? Uh, it's, a, it's a variety of issues. So most drivers are independent contractors. So some may have health insurance, but some, a significant portion do not. Some may have some coverage, but it's not adequate. Um, when we looked at the health benefits fund in 2012, one of the biggest uh, complaints that we got, and it wasn't just a complaint, it was a real life situation, um, and, it, and in some cases a life and death situation, is when drivers are injured or fall ill, the uh, workers' comp and unemployment sometimes is either not available or inadequate to bridge the time that they're out of work, and they have no other way for m m earning money. Um, we, in July, lost, I think, a, a very important voice in the taxi industry, Beresford Simmons, um, and he is unfortunately an example of somebody who was often ill um, and couldn't support himself because he couldn't drive his taxi, but there was no other disability payments that were available to him. Uh, so I think that still remains um, a big issue for drivers, what to do when you're unable to drive uh, due to uh, a health crisis, whether it be uh, on the job or not. Uh, and I think what's makes the situation more complex today is in 2012 we were looking at about 30,000 drivers. Today the pool is 180,000 drivers. So not only has that pool grown, but the complexity of what their different needs are has grown. So I think this study will be extremely enlightening. Um, it will have to be very comprehensive so that we identify what exactly are the benefits that drivers need. Uh, how much that costs, and the best vehicle for funding it. Yeah, this is, uh, we all agree that uh, health insurance for drivers is, is a most, but reading your statement, you say the, the fund was struck down because a court found that its creation exceeded our agency jurisdiction. That was, when was that? When was that? In 2012, uh, actually, the, the decision came out in April of 2014 under uh, the charter, the city charter that defines the TLC, which is the agency's jurisdiction. We can oversee um, with broad authority over for hire vehicle transportation, um, setting licensing standards, how for hire vehicle interacts with public transportation, but the court felt because the charter didn't also say and the health and welfare of drivers that we lacked the jurisdiction to promulgate rules to support a health care fund. The bill that's introduced today that we're having a hearing on would in essence give TLC that authority. Uh, so. Do you think there is a possibility that this time the court will, will allow it and that we, because the, the speaker is, is introducing the bill again. Do you see that it, that it, will, that it will go through the court or it will happen the same thing that to the... And uh, I, I certainly expect that any driver health care fund um, will, will be uh, the... the validity of it will be litigated because on many TLC policies that are of significant change to the industry, litigation follows. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the bill will not be held up. I think what council's doing today is exactly what the judge was saying needed to be done in order to expand the TLC's jurisdiction. But luckily we both have the benefit of your uh, counsel 
legal team, our law department, and our city ledge teams um, to make sure that it's done right and that it does withstand any challenge, which I'm sure will come. Uh, I, I, do, I would like to see you, to hear your personal opinion. Do you think this have a future, or, this, or do you think this is an exercise of future again? Oh, I certainly think it has a future. It's a future, so it could be true. This time we could move Absolutely. To You're addressing the, the fault that the judge found in the first version of health care. Thank you. Thank you. And the other one is the bill, the one that I'm introducing. As you know, when the, when the dri Uber drivers have a, a car and, and they make the money, Uber takes the money to pay their cars. So Uber is acting as a, as a leasing company too. And we're trying to say to Uber, you, you, you cannot keep taking the money away. Let the driver pay the car. You cannot keep taking away the, uh, like that. So I, I hear that you're supporting that. Yeah, we've seen, I've seen leases that where the interest rate that the driver gets on the loan is conditioned on them having the loan payment deducted from their Uber pay. So if they choose to end that Uber pay deduction, they will get a higher interest rate. Um, and so I, you know, sometimes it, it, it's very difficult for drivers to get the car loan and the Uber deduction, you know, allows them to get a little lower interest rate. But what's troublesome about a deduction like that is in a world where we have lots of expenses, maybe due to children or family or rent or the deduction because it's automatically taken out prioritize payment of the car over other life expenses that a driver might need to meet. So there may be some drivers that, that like it, but you know, I think that's a, a, you've identified an area where assuming that it's okay in every case is something that we should review. Thank you, Commissioner. I just I have no more questions just to tell you that I'm looking forward to see you in the Bronx on <laughs> September 25th. Okay, I'll see you there. <laughs> the, Bronx is the, the Bronx is the best county in the USA. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I know my, if I know my uh, Levine. Council member Levine is also with us. Council member Lander. Uh, Council member Lander. Thank you. You know, I always have questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for convening this hearing. And again, to you and the speaker for your leadership in getting us here, moving through that prior package, and moving forward to get this package of bills introduced at the same time uh, so that we can really make significant progress in this sector. I want to thank you and the speaker for doing it. Um, you've already had meaningful conversation about Interest 1052 and the Driver Benefits Fund, but I'm really grateful uh, to the TLC, to you personally, you've taken leadership on this issue long before the council did, you know, under, in the prior administration, trying to find a way through a thorny set of practical and legal issues to meet a very real need. I, we just all know, we all live in the world, it's very difficult without, you know, good access to health insurance, without access to disability, without access to paid sick days, without access to retirement benefits, to function as a human being in the world. And those of us that are lucky enough to collect our wages on a W-2 have structures set up for us to help us manage and support our lives in ways that all people need. And we are not providing not just to for hire vehicle and taxi drivers, but of course to the growing number of independent workers and freelancers in the economy. And we've, we've allowed the economy to shift and grow a whole sector where people don't have a social safety net. And I think it's really important and valuable that New York City is trying to say, that's not all right, and we're gonna do what we can to put a new social safety net in place that is hard in areas where we don't have a real regulatory hold, and this is a place where we do. So uh, I'm grateful to the TLC for working with uh, New York Taxi Workers Alliance previously to try to figure this out. I'm sorry the judge found that the authority didn't, wasn't there at that time, uh, especially after a, what I thought was a reasonable deal had been negotiated, but I am glad. I've been working you know, with you and your team now for five years in the hopes that we could create clear legal authority for you to be able to take this important step, and I think it's really valuable. I'm glad we're on the cusp, I hope, 
of doing it and that these bills are being heard. I want to just ask you to drill down a little bit more in the kind of thinking we need to do. Um, I think the legal questions are pretty straightforward. Once we have passed this bill, we will have satisfied what the judge identified as the need to give clear legal authority to the TLC to do it. So that's great. But that's just question one. Obviously, as you started to lay out, um, how do we pay for it you know, in a world where so many things have shifted and we've got different forms of payment and different surcharges and a whole different regulatory environment, part of which we just helped create? Um, uh, how do we think with drivers about the diversity and range of benefits that would be valuable to them given this whole set of needs? How do we think about what the tax treatment is? Um, you've set up a bunch of these studies in thoughtful ways, but I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you'll think about, um, you know, getting all those questions researched, getting as much input uh, as you can uh, so we can not only come out with a good piece of legislation, but with a, a really strong program in a complicated space. So I think it's two parts, De deciding what benefits are the priorities and then figuring out the funding mechanism, a and then that third part, how much does this all cost? Um, for figuring out what benefits should be the priority, we have to work with Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, um, as well as other city agencies that are knowledgeable on health benefits administration. Uh, I, I think that that will, that will ultimately end up being something um, that will take time. I mean, it will be detailed, but it's what needs to be done, which is a survey of all of our drivers to find how, out what they're missing in healthcare coverage, and not just healthcare. Um, I've heard drivers testify about the need for some kind of, um, you know, uh, retirement uh, option because many drivers, as they get older, they can't drive those hours anymore, and if they stop work, they have no um, support system. So that's something I would like us to be exploring as well, as well as the sort of supplemental disability that I identified earlier. Um, that that will be a painstaking study, uh, but I think it has to be done in order to get a better handle on it. In terms of funding, the bill outlines surcharge, and I would encourage the council to sort of explore whether it has to be a surcharge um, for a number of reasons, but primarily because a surcharge for a driver adds to the total cost of the fare, and a passenger just sees the cost of the fare go up and whenever something happens in a direction that a passenger is not happy with, they of course, you know, that reflects on the driver. Whether that's the driver's fault or not, they're the one in the car. If my bill, my trip just went up a dollar, you know, the driver's there. Um, and so that's not necessarily a customer service plus for drivers to have it labeled as another surcharge, but I do believe there are other funding mechanisms. Uh, when we did this last time, the sick, we raised the fares and added a portion of that raise to fund health care. So, so just so I understand that distinction, a surcharge like appears as an additional as an charge. You're like saying to the customer, you're paying an extra whatever it is, uh, whereas you could build it into the fare, still collect it, but not kind of hold it in the right. customer's So a taxi space today, the same a way. customer's going to see a 50% surcharge for the MTA, 30 cents for the taxi improvement fund. The new congestion fee is coming in in January 1st, and that'll be another $2.50. If there's a night differential or, you know, or anything like that, that's another surcharge. So to add one more surcharge, um, I don't think will be a, 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 a well-received among passengers, both in the black car, livery, lux limo, and, and taxi industries. Um, have you done uh, surveys of drivers of the type you're describing here? Was there one done last time, or have you done something comparable? There's, um, there's been more informal than I think is required here, uh, but what we did last time was I think much more focused, and again, the group was 30,000 more easily identifiable, um, and so it was, uh, I think, easier for us to get a handle on what we could provide and because it was funding not a, not a specific health care provision, it was a little easier for us to sort of um, not master, but like 
provide the, the framework for getting that going. But I, I have full faith that uh, we will get to the bottom of what really, I mean, it's not an unsolvable problem. It's just a question that we need to take the time to answer correctly. And then my last, I mean, this is maybe more a suggestion than a question, just in addition to folks in the TLC universe, drivers and stakeholders, to Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, it seems to me that the set of questions around independent worker benefits and incentives for them, you know, these questions of might there be favorable tax treatment for some uses under existing state or federal law, or could there be? Um, some of the thinking freelancers union has been doing, some of the thinking our own Office of Labor and Policy Standards have been doing. Um, we should just really, you know, we're, we're at the cutting edge of something that I think is, is important um, and is going to have a lot broader future in thinking about what portable benefits look like uh, more broadly for independent workers. It so it could be a model for other jurisdictions if, if we get it right. So very good. We need to. <laughs> Thank you very much again for all your leadership on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. We have joined, have been joined by Council Member Constantinides. To all my colleagues, I have about 50 people that would like to testify today. So we have a long day, but I, who has two questions? So I'm gonna ask my colleagues to, try to make it as brief as possible. Council Member Levin has some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hello, Commissioner. I'm pleased to be lead sponsor of Intro 1069, which you referenced in your opening remarks and would direct the city to conduct a study of the problem of excessive medallion debt. And this committee has covered this topic extensively, um, the enormous human toll that that is taking on particularly independent drivers who have sunk their life savings into this asset. And the public unfortunately probably identifies taxi ownership with people like Michael Cohen, um, who are gonna do just fine. They don't need our support. But there are um, thousands of driver operator owners who are suffering enormous hardship after having bought an asset because they had a guarantee from the city about its underlying worth. And, and we can and should debate who's responsible uh, for the collapse of this asset, but we cannot debate who the victims are, and, uh, and those are um, deeply sympathetic New Yorkers, predominantly immigrant, working class people who are, are facing uh, the financial abyss uh, because of the collapse of this asset. Um, and I think we, need, we owe it to them uh, to explore solutions, to find a solution, and to do it quick. Um, not to wait years and years because people's lives are on the line. Uh, you and your remarks in, in response to this bill, I think, cited a number of, of concerns and obstacles. One is that um, you feel we have inadequate information. Um, did you mean we don't have enough information to identify a solution today or that we lack information sufficient enough even to conduct a study of solutions? Uh I think today we do not have a good understanding of what the whole universe of medallion lending, I mean, actually individual medallion lending, I'll put the corporate aside for the moment. Um, and that is because when we do a medallion, we authorize a medallion transfer, we don't see the underlying loan agreement and we don't know the terms, we don't know if there's other collateral attached. Ideally, we would get a full, um, a full picture of, how, so for example, how many loans fall in the 800,000 to 400,000 category, how many loans fall into the 400 to 200, what were the refinancing terms, is there other collateral attached to that? And I think that would all be very important to understand how best to work out um, debt relief uh, on a very broad um, and I am not an economist or a banker, so I get to say this. <laughs> um, you know, my sort of broad overview is that banks should, they have two choices right now. They can, you know, try to get as much as they can out of the borrowers and then foreclose on the loan, which is not a happy ending for anybody. Or they can write what I would call right-size the loan, which is look at what medallion owners can actually bring in today and yes they'll have to give up part of the 
of the loan. It won't, they'll have to reduce the principal. Um, but they will also be able to continue a relationship with a borrower, and the borrower will not be in sort of, uh, you know, at, with nothing. The borrower will still then be able to continue doing what they've been doing um, for decades in many cases. Uh, and so that takes some, you know, that takes a haircut on the bank's um, part, but it does provide a more long-standing solution for the medallion owner and really the bank too, because then it is a viable loan. It is no longer a loan that they can't collect on. Well, I'm all for banks, and there's also a lot of non-bank lenders here, credit unions and, and loan funds. And I'm just lumping them all yes. together. I'm all for all these lenders showing flexibility uh, in a way that avoids the lose-lose that you described that a foreclosure is. Um, I think we'd be naive if we thought that was going to happen. That's why I said I, I get to scale. see this even though I'm not a banker. <laughs> and, and, and it's incumbent on the public sector, I think, to figure this out. Uh, other cities have explored uh, some sort of bailout mechanism. I think New York City should as well. The obvious solution is that it could be financed um, out of the app-based business um, because it was the rise of the apps which have brought upon this crisis. Um, so it seems like charging uh, for app-based affairs, putting that money into a fund, which then can help compensate owner-operated drivers, not the Michael Cohens of the world, but the little guys, to me, it seems like a smart solution. Um, why, why would that not be the best answer? I would actually say I would compliment because many of the loans today are so high because it's a function of sort of churning the market, which you know, the Michael Cohen's maybe of the world were part and parcel to ha having this inflated loan value because every time you bought and sold, you went back to the bank and now your medallion was worth more, so they lent you more. But that affected individual owners too. And so, yes, they could borrow more, but it continued to inflate the value of the medallion and, and therefore the, the loans were larger. And they were significantly not tied to the income. So any bailout or financial, um, financial assistance should also be accompanied by making those loans in line with what somebody can earn because they are um, often out of line today. And I think that combination would actually be the ideal combination. Yes, the lenders deserve plenty of blame, but again, I think we need to find a pool of funds to help uh, ease the pain on these individuals who did nothing wrong, played by the rules as they were established for generations. And uh, the obvious place to look for that money are the app-based services, which have driven the collapse of this asset. And I would hope that um, the study of this legislation would mandate, uh, would explore the feasibility uh, and legality of that, because I do think that's the best solution. Absolutely. And I'm gonna pass it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Vallone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. You should be applauded. Once again, you are handling the hearing on your own without a litany of staff to your left and right, which almost every other commissioner does. So thank you for that. Uh, studies are, I'm always a big fan, I think we all are, of trying to get a better gauge of the industry and seeing how we bring protection and parity. Uh, so I think. The City Council's bills for that are important. As we go forward, I think it might help. What is in existence today on the state level for state and insurance protection, workers' comp insurance, versus what the driver's fund will create to fill the gap as a safety net? Because I, I, we also want to try to re avoid duplicity and any extra cost if we don't have to. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point. Um, and I'll give you what I know from my limited, um, but we'll certainly consult with the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene um, as well as HRA to get a better understanding and um, can give you a more comprehensive answer. Um, but what we come across the most is uh, workers' comp, um, which is what the uh, taxi industry is entitled to under state law. Um, if you're in the livery sector, you have what's called the Livery Benefits Fund, which unfortunately only compensates you if you're hurt 
while you're transporting a passenger and if the injury is basically catastrophic, you, you lose a limb. Um, if it is something less than that, you will not get any compensation. Uh, the other uh, workers' comp, uh, the other workers' comp um, is for the black car and Lux limo, and that's administered by the black car fund, and that also provides full workers' comp benefits. But again, it's um, while you're transporting passengers. So if it's an off-duty injury or or any health crisis like you know you know cancer is certainly something that takes somebody out of work and you can't sort of pin it down to a specific ride then those programs aren't of much help to drivers so then so then two things you have places in the industry where there's some but not enough and other places in the industry where there's barely anything right so if these were to pass, we were going to provide that net for those instances, or are we going to play a layer over the whole thing? And that's where my concern is. Yeah, so I think um, we first have to understand what are the, what are the, prov what protections does sort of across the board people have or have available to them and kind of build up to see where that pool gets narrower and narrower, where some people are getting lots of benefits and this sort of group of people that have um, less than ideal benefits. Um, but you really want to be able to give a consistent package to the entire group, especially since drivers move from sector to sector, so they couldn't be hard to have your benefits package change depending on whether you were driving a livery or a yellow. Um, but I, I really... I could work around that because if, if today two people got into a car accident, if there was a primary insurance, a secondary insurance, a workers' comp insurance, a no-fault insurance, they work it out. There's always one that's primary over the other, depending on if it was at work or whether it was for private use. Um, and I like the idea of providing an overall umbrella. And if there is a more primary insurance, that we don't create that duplicative cost on anyone, the driver, the, the passenger, or the owner, that that insurance company will still have the primary role. And I think that's important. I I'm invite you to be a consultant in the on the study. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's important. Um, would you say that certain sectors are different throughout the city, or as you're looking at where the cars are driving in each borough, it's it's uniform? In terms of what drivers need, mm -hmm. um, I think it's definitely broke a, a difference um, when it comes to workers' comp among the sectors. But I don't know today whether there's a difference among the sectors when it comes to health benefits and like medical services and the like. And I think that's where the study is important. Yes. I think trying to get our handle on looking at that will make us better to be prepared for that. If we have to extend the 90 days, I think we should do that. Um, if we need more time, I think we should do that. And make sure we give you the tools to make sure that the industry is fairly. For example, when we tried to raise the minimum insurance that each car must carry, it was all over the place. Yeah. And we got attacked for saying, hey, you have to provide the same insurance in every car, because if my daughter is in a car, I want to make sure there's enough insurance if, God forbid, there's an accident. This is a similar situation. We just want yes. parity across the board for everyone. And, and for insurance, as you know, TLC cars have a higher level of insurance than required by the state, but it's the same level across sectors. They all have to pay the, uh, have a policy for that higher level. And, and the last thing I'll bring up, Mr. Chair, is if in determining the costs, um, I know we use the language on a, on a, a cap on the leasing costs. Um, is that the best way to determine? Because I, as whether it's an owner or a homeowner or an employee, my costs vary year to year. So is there maybe a better way than capping what the costs should be? Because there's good and there's bad in every industry. Some people walk away from leases, don't pay the tickets, don't pay the, the overpass. Sometimes the owner gets stuck and vice versa. You have bad owners, they're going to increase the fees higher than it should be. So maybe we should look at an annual maximum amount that can be charged based on the industry standards. I'm just, I get nervous yeah. when I cap. So uh, um, we're op certainly open to exploring and, get, and getting some flexibility to, to regulate in this area. Uh, what we do in the taxi space is we, for people that lease on a, like a weekly basis or on a daily basis, we set a cap for the amount that can be charged for the vehicle. For people that are in a lease to own, we initially started out with um, a cap for the 
the final dollars that were owed that would be spread out over three years as well as with a weekly cap on the payments. Um, but what we found is that um, people w didn't really love on both sides the three years and so we then went back and said okay you can extend the loan period for a longer period of time as long as you still aren't at the end of the day charging someone more than X. So I appreciate what you say about having some flexibility. That doesn't mean that you're not overseeing that area. It just um, allows sort of individuals to sometimes customize depending on what their borrowing ability is and lending ability is. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman. Before I, before I bring Councilmember Rodriguez, let me let me ask you a question on leasing. I have a, in my office, Jenny, and he has so many complaints of drivers that have been exploded by, by leasing companies. And they, a car that costs $25,000, they end up paying $60,000. And more. And more. So I know I'm glad you you are aware of this, mm -hmm. and I need your help to to be sure that we that the, that we could stop this, because it's a big abuse been doing been doing to the drivers, and today we have some drivers that will be testifying. Uh, I want to hear testimony on them on, on on those kind of abuses, but I, I'm 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 glad that uh, that you. <laughs> you know what's going on with the drivers and with the leasing company. They're making too much money and, and, and killing the drivers. And I use the word killing, not killing physically. I'm killing, that's the word I use when I think somebody being abused. So, so thank you for, for your welcome. concern on that. And we hopefully going to work together to, to, end, to end those abuses. A council member, uh, Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. I, I feel that, first of all, thank you, Commissioner, for the great job you've been doing and being in a difficult situation. You know, this reality of the taxi industry is like, it's like a tsunami for those 6,000 individual medallion owners that they bought the promise that we made to them that if they will invest in medallion owner, they will be able to get something valuable that they could use to get a loan to send the kids to college, to buy the houses. And suddenly they wake up and they saw how the city failed to them. So here we are, and as you say, trying to do the best we can in a crisis that didn't happen overnight, that had been happening as a result of the accumulation of you know, individual and corporation trying to take advantage of the open market society that we have. And it worked, but in these particular cases, we have not been a strong advocate and we have failed to the industry. So we tried to establish and we did a universal license and we were able to Pass some love in the past, and now with the chairman, we also be moving all the important law. But now the question is, you know, are we ready to discuss a potential type of bailout to those 6,000 medallion owners that we fail? And I know that we had to look at the 15,000 as a universe, individual that they own those medallions, corporation on and individual owners, but when, where do we have to go in order to give some hope to those individuals, especially a thousand medallion owners that they are in some kind of arrears with the bank and credit unions, some closes to go for a foreclosure? Um, 
So I think the, the bill reviewing medallion debt is extremely important, as well as your task force, which will look more broadly at medallion issues. Um, but they take time. So more immediately, we've been working with Department of Consumer Affairs to make sure that medallion owners can get to financial empowerment centers where they can meet with a financial advisor and determine what choices they have. Um, the choices may not be pleasant, but they need to know they have choices because um, without that kind of consultation, a, a sense of hopelessness and lack of choices sets in. So we've been working with financial uh, empowerment centers as well as neighborhood trust to send owners uh, and drivers as, to that resource as well. Um, so we need to continue, and the Driver Assistance Center will certainly help us with that continue to make sure that we're all out getting drivers and owners connected with city services to help them through their immediate problems, which is something is due at the end of the month. And that's a, a rental or a mortgage payment. My second question is, can we agree that we created a, stop, created a taxi industry where, you know, labor, black car, they're supposed to be serving in a particular way, but that we also created this industry where we give the exclusive pickup and drop up to the yellow taxi to be the one to be able to provide those services throughout the five boroughs. Uh, yes, yellow taxis have the only are the only sector that can pick up by hail on the street in the five boroughs. Um, and, but the world is changing, and so many newer passengers, younger passengers that use for hire, uh, they don't know how to raise their hand, they do everything on their phone. So what we've been really trying to do is also make sure that the taxi industry can function by app the exact same way the black car industry does. And that's through things like our flex fare pilot, which allows them to give upfront pricing, something that uh, a, a FHV customer today, if they use the apps, they're going to compare. Well, this company will give me this price, this company will give me this price, and that's how they make their decision. Now taxi can be one of those choices because they can provide the price up front. And so we really have to think about making sure that the taxi industry has the freedom and the technological tools to compete. Nosotros vamos a ir trabajando con la comisionada, con el presidente de comité, para asegurarnos de que sigamos identificando leyes que permitan de que los pasajeros tengan buen servicio, pero que también todos los choferes de todas las áreas de la industria también sean protegidos. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, I think that we uh, have no more questions for you. I thank you for being here today. You're welcome. We did good today, right? <laughs> Behavior marks were very high today. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. We have been joined by Council Member Rose. I just want to mention I'm leaving yeah, these more. flyers, but is there a better place to put them so people, drivers can, and owners can pick them up? In the back? Okay. I'm going to call Elena. Taxi? Elena Tatis, Senior Program Officer for New York City Consumer Affairs Department. Casey Adams, Director of City Legislative Affairs of Consumer Affairs. And Dr. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner of Mental Health Department. They're not here? They're going? Give it back to me. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna call Christine. Christine Johnson. 
NWACP, James Canigliaro Jr., founder and president of IDG, James Parrott, Center for New York City FM, Richard Lipsky, Lucius Riccio, are they here or no? Yeah. I'm calling you guys. So who's here? Yeah. Let me call it again. I'm going to call it again. Christine Johnson is here? Okay. James Parrott is he here? Okay. James Carnigliaro Jr. Okay. Yes. Richard Lipsky? No. No. Down. 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 Those are those are here no more. Uh, Who are you? Lucio Riccio. Who's that? Okay. Peter Mason. This is done. This is done. Okay. Richard, you were called. Okay. Uh, let's start with you. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman Diaz, uh, council uh, members. You, uh, each one of you have two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Go. Good morning, Chairman Diaz, Council Members. My name is Jim Canigliaro, Jr. I'm the President of the Independent Drivers Guild and affiliate of the Machinist Union. Um, it's been a pleasure working with this Council and this Committee on uh, the various things that we were able to do for the industry. Um, and we look forward to continuing that relationship. As you know, we're currently working under a capped vehicle scenario um, uh, without capping the amount of drivers that scenario will lead to many more drivers than there are vehicles. That will also inevitably lead to the exploitation of drivers um, by leasing companies. Uh, if there are more drivers than there are vehicles, those companies will in fact act like companies and see how much more they can charge drivers for that lease. Um, or the other side of that, drivers will voluntarily pay more because this is the job that they need in order to provide for their families. Um, had we capped licenses and drivers and not vehicles, the opposite would have happened and that these companies would have competed with a limited customer base in order to give drivers the best prices possible. That is not the current system we're working under and so I think this bill regarding regulation of leasing companies is a good bill and a good start. I also want to talk briefly about the health care bill that is proposed. We are in support um, of any uh, of additional benefits to drivers. As you know, drivers, a um, vast majority of drivers are underinsured and do not have that social safety net that we talked about earlier. Uh, I would urge uh, council members and the chair to take a look at the Black Car Fund and the work that they've done in providing benefits to drivers. The Machinist Union worked 20 years ago alongside industry leaders and drivers to create the first workers' compensation fund and the only in this country. Uh, they're doing great work with drivers regarding vision insurance and telemedicine, and I invite you, Chairman Diaz, and all other council members to take a look at that work. We're supportive of these bills and look forward to working together. Good morning. James Parrott is my name. I'm Director of uh, Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs. Let me start by congratulating the chair and, and the entire council on the passage, the historic passage of the package of five bills uh, in, in, in August. I thought that was an excellent start. Today we have another nine bills, I think, that make further progress in uh, coming to grips with this rapid growth in the for hire vehicle industry. Along with Professor Reich of the University of California at Berkeley, we conducted uh, the first extensive study of uh, for hire vehicle driver earnings in New York City. We examine the prevailing business model used by the app dispatch companies. Uh, we consider the fact that the drivers are responsible for the bulk of the capital investment that's deployed in this industry. 
and we found that 85% of drivers had net earnings after operating expenses that were below $17.22 an hour. Intro 1052 that deals with health benefits is particularly important. In our report, we had data on the current uh, health insurance coverage of uh, taxi and for hire vehicle drivers. That information uh, indicated that 40% of drivers have income so low that they qualify for Medicaid. Another 16% have no insurance at all. Around 25% are, uh, of drivers are covered by employer-provided health insurance. But because most of these drivers in this industry are not employees, the 25% who have uh, employer-provided health insurance is probably through their spouse. There's an urgent need to assist the financially stressed medallion owner drivers. Intro 304 uh, established a, t a task force to study medallion values. Intro 1069 would explore how to address the problem of medallion owner debt. Two other bills, 1068 and 1081, relate to providing financial and other assistance, such as mental health benefits to taxi and for hire vehicle drivers. Based on our research on the industry and the situation of drivers, these bills call for much needed assistance. Three of the bills involve TLC establishing regulations regarding the leasing, rental, or conditional purchase of for hire vehicles. 1070, clarifying the description of any deduction from high uh, volume for hire vehicle driver pay. 1096, and protecting for hire vehicle drivers in the event of the loss of digital payments made by passengers. 1062. Um, and uh, 1079, uh, of course, establishes a much needed office of inclusion at the TLC. Based on the research, the extensive research we've done on this industry, uh, these bills are, uh, represent important progress and help complement the historic uh, actions taken on August the 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. turn this on? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the critically important legislation proposed. The very survival of our essential transportation institutions is at stake, and you have addressed that concern with diligence and wisdom. As a former New York City Transportation Commissioner and a former MTA board member, I congratulate the Council and the Mayor for finally placing a limit on the growth of the digitally-based for hire vehicle industry. Without that legislation, the transportation institutions which have enabled the city to grow and business to thrive, the very bedrocks of our economy, could be weakened to the point that New York City could lose its place as a leading city in the world. I'm especially supportive of the studies you propose. The public needs to understand the damage that is being done and the opportunity that is being missed. I'm hopeful that these studies will return sanity to decision making in the transportation sector. Although I would like to see, as I have testified before, a limit placed on four hire vehicles equal to the number of yellow and green medallions in existence, I understand that that might be too much to ask. I've also testified that four hire vehicles are getting away with institutional murder by operating without paying anywhere near the fair share, their fair share of street space. Yellows and greens pay a medallion fee and then pay about $15,000 per year in taxes and fees. The four hire vehicles pay about $200. $75. They don't even pay the MTA 50 cents per ride surcharge. Not charging them what the medallion vehicles pay is a missed opportunity to raise the money needed for mass transit and other transportation improvements, improvements which are necessary for New York's future. Not only must we bring our current system to a state of good repair, but we need a new subway line for each decade for the next 100 years to stay competitive, competitive with other great cities in the world. Where is that money going to come from? Charge the four hired vehicles what the city charges the medallion vehicles. The yellows have a contract with the city for the exclusive right to spontaneous rides in the Midtown area. That contract, born from the medallion fee and reinforced by the creation of the green cab regulations, has been violated by the city by allowing the new four hired vehicles into the space without paying and without an EIS. To correct this economic injustice and policy mistake, I propose that the City Council charge any of these new four hired vehicles a fee of $10,000 per year if they want to pick up in the Midtown area and a charge of $1,000 per year to operate outside the area. In essence, I want the council to designate new for hire vehicles as either yellow for hire vehicles or green for hire vehicles. The yellow Ubers, Lyfts, and Vias would pay $10,000 per year, which would give them the right to pick up in the Midtown area and anywhere else in the city. The green Ubers at all would pay $1,000 okay. per year and could pick up outside the Midtown area. They could operate under the green medallion rules. I estimate this would raise a half a million 
a five hundred million to a billion dollars. Thank you, sir. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Diaz and members of the committee. My name is Kristen Johnson, and I'm testifying on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Thanks for this opportunity to testify in support of Intro 1079. I've testified before the City Council twice this year, and we are gratified that the Council took our concerns and those of others seriously. Likewise, we're encouraged by the initiative to create an Office of Inclusion, which we believe has the potential to meaningfully address the widespread and persistent problem in this city of trying to hail a cab while black. I urge you to vote yes on this bill. So for decades, black New Yorkers have lived with the uncertainty of whether a taxi licensed by the city will refuse to serve them. Beyond violating the law, these persistent ride refusals are an attack on our dignity. We've worked with the TLC and testified before the council to try to end these unacceptable denials of service and send a clear message that New York City will not tolerate this discrimination anymore. The Office of Inclusion can play an important role in making transportation more equitable for people of color in New York City. To do this most effectively, we would make several recommendations regarding the implementation of Intro 1079. First, Intro 1079 refers only to the director of the Office of Inclusion. The office, of course, cannot be effective unless it is adequately staffed and funded. The office should be staffed with a sufficient number of people to, to perform all of the responsibilities of the office and test new programs. And the staff should reflect the diversity of New York City. Second, the director must be a highly qualified leader. This new office will require someone who will lead with vision, determination, and a strong commitment to fighting racism and all forms of discrimination. Third, we believe the responsibility of the office to compile and report statistics relating to which communities are affected by service refusals is vital. The impact of this reporting, though, will only be as good as the data. We recommend that the data collected reflect both information from drivers and the experiences of people who use taxis on a regular or moderate basis. Fourth, we recommend that the office regularly solicit input from stakeholders and the community. Fifth, we recommend the office study the frequency with which taxi drivers themselves are subjected to discriminatory harassment while on the job. Finally, we recommend that the office explore different measures that could help deter racially biased ride refusals. We urge you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Diaz and members of the committee. I am Peter Mazur, General Counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Cab Board of Trade. Our 66-year-old association represents the owners of about 5,700 medallion taxi cabs and operates a full-service driver resource center to help thousands of drivers with their licensing issues and offer training classes for 5,000 drivers. We also represent drivers with respect to nearly 3,000 traffic court summonses, handle 3,000 oath cases, and have made more than 300 appearances in criminal court on behalf of taxi cab drivers, all without charging our drivers a penny. There are many well-intended pieces of legislation before the Council today, most of which we support. MTBOT has submitted written comments on each of these bills. We ask they be part of the record, but I'd like to limit my time this morning to address 1052, the health care bill. At the outset, I would say that everyone should have affordable health care available. That includes more than 185,000 taxi and livery drivers who are presently licensed by the TLC. Drivers, owners, and the public all benefit from a healthy workforce. But I must ask if this approach taken in the bill is the best way. The bill would impose an undetermined passenger surcharge to afford to fund an array of benefits. No analysis has been performed to determine benefit costs. In my written comments, I performed an analysis for the taxi cab industry, and I estimated that a surcharge of nearly $3 a trip would be required to fund the benefits that would be offered in this bill. On January 1, 2019, a surcharge will go into effect that will impose a $2.75 additional fare on for hire vehicles and $3 on taxi cabs solely to fund the MTA. That agency will receive the equivalent of a one-way passenger fare from nearly one million taxi cab and livery drivers each day without having to add a single bus, train, or any staff to move these people. Our drivers get nothing from this except, in all likelihood, lost fares as the for hire transportation becomes even more expensive and more passengers are priced out of the market. If we add another surcharge, ridership will undoubtedly plummet even further. And how does this help our drivers? I would just conclude briefly. We, don't, we do not provide any benefit to our drivers if we deprive them of the income they need to support themselves and their families by continually imposing massive passenger surcharge. We can all talk about providing a living wage for drivers, but this council cannot force anyone to take a taxi or livery if they become unaffordable. With fares expected to exceed $10 before a vehicle even moves an inch, we are fast approaching that point. 
I believe the best solution is not to destroy taxi driver incomes with another surcharge, but look at other ways to help restore this industry and instill passenger confidence so more passengers can use these means of transportation with. I definitely agree with you. No more surcharges. Thank you. Okay? I definitely agree with you. It's not my bill, but I'm against that. Right. Thank you. And if I can just add one final point, I want to agree with my uh, colleague that we need in any office of, of inclusion to look at discriminatory practices against all licensees. Thank you, Chairman, <coughs> Chairman Diaz. Uh, my name is Richard Lipsky. I've been working for the last two and a half years on behalf of medallion owners. It's been a long uh, period of time punctuated by bankruptcies, foreclosures, and suicides. The warning lights are ahead for the City Council and for our medallion owners. There's a glimmer of hope generated, but the fear about the next steps remain. The fear doesn't lie with the City Council. The fear lies with the knowledge that the laws that you have passed must be made strong by the regulations pursuant to them. We are not confident, as the speaker was, with the current leadership down at the TLC. And that's not something that's an emotional reaction, it's a reaction of watching the leadership over the last four years acting in the benefit not of taxi medallion owners but of others. And some of the other medallion owners who are here will uh, emphasize those points. We don't feel the TLC leadership is supportive of medallion owners and when the suicides occurred, the first reaction from the chair was to talk about mental health issues instead of talking about the insufficiency of her role as a leader in making sure that we didn't reach that point. We have a letter to the speaker and to the mayor that we, will, that we have already submitted that emphasize this point. We also want to emphasize that so far as we've seen that the TLC has not moved quickly to start to promulgate rules pursuant to the legislation that you passed. You're interested in what happened, um, what happened in the past. Uh, you're interested in medallion values. You need to do two things. You need to have strong regulations. You need to reduce the number of cars. And you need to make sure that every single car, Uber, Lyft, or whatever, is hooked by central computer to the TLC so there's real-time data. You want health benefits, you want wages, you want all these things to be understood. You can't unless you get real-time data. We call, and finally, we call on the mayor and the council to be vigilant, to make sure that this TLC leadership is going to be responsive to the needs of medallion owners. If you're okay. not, then we will see the repercussions of more so you, suicides so, later. So you're telling me that Tell me that the commissioner is not doing a good job? We don't think so, and we think that the TLC should be put under new management. <laughs> gentlemen, th ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation. I'm calling Mike Q. Mike Q here. Mike. Jeffrey Rose. Is Jeffrey Rose here? He is. John Puglambe. John Puglambe. Is he here or no? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Jose Altamirano. I'm gonna, I, uh, is he here or no? Jose Altamirano. No. Viravi Desai. Viravi. You see? Uh, Baravi. Oh, Baravi. Zubin Soleimani. How many you got there? We got to move, ladies and gentlemen. I got to go to the restroom again. Me too. Ladies first.
Good morning. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chairman Diaz, members of the council. It's great to be back here today. Um, I'm Beta V. Desai, Executive Director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. We've already submitted to you written testimony um, in uh, expressing our support of the bills. I mean, of course, almost all of these bills come directly out of our platform, which hundreds of drivers in a unity campaign among app drivers, yellow cab drivers, green livery, corporate black car drivers, we campaigned for for months right outside of these halls. And we're really gratified to see this phase two. You know, the cap brought a lot of hope to a workforce that's been in some serious despair. But we know that the reality is the crisis among drivers is far from over. And that all of these bills combined really are a starting point. As far as the, um, as far as, um, you know, bill intro 1070 is concerned, it needs to be passed for people like Abraham Lobe, who ended up paying $78,000 on a used car with 30,000 miles on it. People like Mohammed Islam, who paid $69,634 for a 2014 Toyota Camry with 5,000 miles on it. Brother Bahi Antolo, who paid $84,072 for a Toyota Sienna. Sailufu Halaru, who paid $78,175 for a Toyota Sienna. And the list goes on and on. You know, and let's be really clear, these predatory lending practices, they're not because of a vehicle cap. They have been at the existence at the beginning of this sector. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission actually fined Uber $20 million because of false advertising related to its promises of how much drivers could earn and the promise that they were going to get the best financing deals on these vehicles when they went to Uber's leasing partners. It's a sham that's pre-existed the cab and is a direct result of the oversaturation. This bill is something that we won for yellow cab drivers in 2012, and we're looking forward to winning it for FHV drivers today. Thank you. With your help, we're gonna do away with that. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh. Hi, my name is Michael Keough. I represent the Committee for Taxi Safety. I'm here on behalf of the president of that committee, David Beyer. Um, we're just going to confine our remarks to intro uh, 1052. We've given you written comments. Uh, we support uh, the bills, all of them in terms of concept. Uh, in regards to 1052, you have heard this before. You've heard it from the TLC chair. You've heard it from uh, the Metropolitan Taxi Board of Trade uh, and others. Um, uh, we would recommend that you only pass 1052 if you could remove uh, the surcharge from the language. There are multiple ways in which it could be funded. We discussed a possible way in our written uh, comments. But if the, in the language of the bill, if it could just not be left up to the TLC as to whether or not to institute the surcharge, surcharges have become um, not making fun of anybody or anything in government, because I would never do that, but it's become the default way or the lazy way to fund important initiatives and programs. With a 30 cent uh, fee that is uh, for wheelchair accessibles, um, uh, we still have 2,000 medallions that are wheelchair accessible that are sitting um, idle. With a 50 cent surcharge uh, to fund the MTA, we found that that's not enough to keep the trains running on time. So in January, we're going to have the biggest sticker shock in the history of taxis, where at one time, $2.50 is going to come on taxis. That has never happened in the history of New York. And I know you're both very well aware that any time that we've had uh, any type of a fare increase, there have been a number of months in which passengers avoid taxis. Because of the readily available and cheaper, and nobody is being charged as much as taxis are, and that's important to make, subway fares are being held uh, static, bus fares are being held static. We are going to have, before the taxi moves, even without the health care fee, uh, five dollars before the taxi moves. It's too much for passengers and it won't help us keep these uh, initiatives that you have spearheaded going to help strengthen the industry again, for which we thank you. Thank you. I believe, we all do believe that 
The taxi driver need, needs insurance, needs health insurance. That's something that we have to do. We, we agree. I, I disagree. I disagree with the, with the, the surcharge. So, but I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I want to have insurance for the drivers, uh, the health insurance. That part, I have a I have problem with that part too. But this is not, it is not my bill, it is the speaker bill. We all do respect, I'm disagreeing with that part. Too. We totally agree, we think that everybody should have adequate health uh, coverage, uh, si and we think it should be just funded a little differently than the, the way the bill authorizes. Estoy diciendo que todos nos sabemos que hay que darle seguro de salud a los choferes que tengan seguro de salud. El, el, la pieza de ley es del speaker, el es el que manda aquí. Yo estoy de, en desacuerdo con, esa, con la parte de esa pieza de ley que le pone carga a los choferes. Esa no es mi ley, es la de speaker, con esto me estoy buscando un problema serio tal vez con el speaker, pero yo no estoy de acuerdo ni respaldo la parte donde le pongan carga a los choferes más de las que tienen. Uh, sir. Good morning, Chairman Diaz. My name is John Paul Klemba. I'm general counsel to the American Transit Insurance Company. I want to thank you very much for inviting us to testify here this morning. I have submitted detailed written testimony, which we've submitted to your staff. The last time I had the opportunity to testify before the City Council was when I served as the New York State Director of Criminal Justice back in 1987. And we sat here and we discussed the Safe Streets Act and answered many questions. I want to commend what you're doing here, not only to protect the drivers, but also the safety of all the citizens of New York. We're located in New York City. We're a New York City-based uh, company. We insure about 75,000 of the 100,000 vehicles that uh, the speaker was referring to earlier this morning. We have created a uh, network of brokers throughout the city. We have developed a considerable amount of knowledge about uh, the taxi business, the for hire business, and all of the issues related thereto. We support all of the legislation that uh, you have put forth here this morning, and we look to partner with you in helping you see that implemented. We've developed a new set of products that we believe that we can deliver all of the services that are required under the bills that we're here today and do that by working with the drivers as we have done for the last 45 years that we've been working here in New York City. So again, I want to commend you, Chairman Diaz. I look forward to working with you and your staff, and I hope that uh, American Transit can be a partner with you as you go forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Chair Diaz. Uh, my name is Zubin Soleimani with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, I've submitted written comments on intro 1070, but given the large amount of legislation on the table today, um, I would like to cede my time back to Ms. Desai to discuss um, some issues affecting uh, owner drivers, with your permission. Thank you. Um, intros 304 and 1069, we think, are the other really critical intros of today. You know, Nicanor Ochesora was one of the owner drivers who had committed suicide during this year. Nicanor was nearing retirement. He watched as what, you know, his investment whittled down to pretty much nothing. And what he saw was in the twilight of his years, when he thought he'd be retiring after working three decades on a cab with his wife, there was no retirement in sight for either of them. Kenny Chow represented a group of owner drivers who essentially purchased their profession. He had been in the jewelry industry where he lost his job. He then came into the yellow cab industry. He, every day he was working to make ends meet and he saw that get harder and harder. Nicanor and Kenny were pushed to the point of desperation. We hope that there is serious action taken through both of these intros that right now are really about a study, but we all know they need to go much deeper than a study. Owner drivers need to see a real material difference in their day-to-day -day life in order to overcome the level of despair and growing poverty. 
with, while there's been a race to the bottom across his entire workforce, the thing about owner drivers is they represent the workers who were in the higher earning and went straight down to become the lowest earning. And there's been no safety net, and it's, it's been a deep slide. And so we hope that through this council initiative that there's a serious effort to look at things like loans and grants, finding a way to lower interest rates, to extend contracts, and for the city itself to look at finding a way to even you know, uh, give relief to a certain percentage of these loans in order to stop the foreclosures and the bankruptcies. And uh, lastly, we agree with you as far as the fund is concerned. This is a long time in the making. It really should just be a beginning, especially when people are at this level of despair. The, the poverty and the desperation has lead to worse health crisis among drivers. We need this benefit, but absolutely, they can be paid for beyond a surcharge. And we, we believe working with you and with this council, we can find that way without sacrificing the lives and the health of drivers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one, of, one of the blessings that I have gotten when I was appointed uh, chairman of this committee is to have people like you guys. Okay, supporting and fighting and because it's, it's not easy. There are some members that will not agree with. So we need, I always need your support to keep pushing the rest of us. Because our heart is in the right place, but we need, so keep pushing, keep, keep fighting, keep supporting us. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. Chairman Reverend Diaz and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be heard on the legislation before the committee today. My name is Jeff Rose, and I'm the president of Laney, the Limo Association of New York. We represent the interests of those for hire vehicle bases in the TLC's luxury limousine category. Many people lump us in with the other operators in the FHV industry, but there is a crucial difference that separates us from the liveries, black car services, and TNCs such as Uber, Lyft, and Via. The vast majority of drivers in those FHV segments are independent contractors who work with little or no economic safety net. They are responsible for paying the cost of their vehicles, gas, insurance, maintenance, and so on. Few, if any, receive company-provided health insurance or other benefits. On the other hand, the vast majority of drivers in the luxury limousine segment are true full-time employees with all the attendant protections and benefits, whether by law or customary practice. The employers cover all of the aforementioned costs associated with operating these company-owned vehicles. Our drivers are not burdened with crippling expenses and debt just to try and make a living. Luxury limo-based employers must, apply with the, must comply with the Affordable Care Act, paying significant premiums to provide health insurance to their employees and their families. These employees are protected by the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, which covers minimum wage, guaranteed overtime, record keeping, and more. Employers are already required to comply with rules on paid sick leave and to provide workers' comp and unemployment insurance and disability. Many offer health coverage that exceeds ACA requirements and offer other benefits such as 401k retirement programs. Moreover, these are good paying jobs that enable entry into the middle class for people who may not have a diploma of any kind. At my company, full-time drivers average around $25 an hour. During busy season, many make over $30 an hour. Already, I have three drivers who are, in within, who are already within reach of earning $100,000 or more by year's end. As the economic disruptors in the FHV industry make it difficult to raise prices, we have had to absorb tremendous increases in the cost associated. If we are compelled to pay even more mandated fees to provide employee-like benefits to independent operators associated with other industry segments while already bearing the cost of providing these benefits to our own employers, employees, many operators will likely cease to exist under what would be a form of double okay. taxation, taking all uh, these up. good legitimate jobs with them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your cooperation. Now we're going to call Jose Rodriguez here. Yeah? Jose Rodriguez. Eligio Hernandez. Eligio Hernandez. Está aquí. Mario Marte. Está Mario Marte aquí. Bridget Félix. 
Pero casi en lo que baja ahí acá abajo. Basilio Beltré. En lo que usted baja acá abajo. Si tienen que hablar español, eh, eh, Jenny le va a traducir. Ok, pueden. Hello, sir. Hey. Si tienen que hacerlo en español, lo dicen en español, Jenny le va a traducir, ¿ok? So, vamos a empezar con usted, caballero. Eh, Saludos a todos. Mi nombre es José R. Rodríguez. Estoy aquí para explicarle de algo que me sucedió, que fue con un, una compañía donde yo hice un contrato y hubo ese engaño. Good afternoon, my name is Jose R. Rodriguez and I thank to be here and my problem is I have a testimony to testify about a problem that I had. Donde le firmé uno, uno contrato donde, donde me perjudicaron bastante y vamos a ver lo que pueda suceder aquí para allá. In which I had a contract and I've had a lot of problems. I want, want to see what's going to happen from here forward. Eh, don, eh, entonces yo he acudido donde el señor Rubén y donde Jenny, que es que me están ayudando en esto. I went to the para, office of Reverend Ruben Diaz and Jenny. Para ver qué va a suceder con mi caso. To see what's going to happen regarding my case. Explique su caso. Bueno, yo hice contrato con, no sé si puedo mencionar sí, el nombre. Sí, puede mencionarlo. Con Coalition, que está en Girón. En el 1472. I had a contract with Quest Libre Releasing and it's located at 1472 Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. Y le firmé los papeles donde ellos, el contrato, donde ellos también pusieron el carro a nombre mío. I signed y, that y, contract and automatically they put the vehicle under my name. Y en realidad no me explicaron bien lo que era, simplemente ella nada me dijo que el papel que yo estaba firmando era para el título. Y no fue así. Eso they era para el banco. They never explained to me what was the contract that I was signing. They told me that it was for their purpose and it wasn't like that. Después de eso, de todo eso, el 28, el mes 8, el mes 8, sí, 28, ya la retracción del carro, ahí ya había que renovarlo. On August y, 28th of this year, I had to renew the vehicle registration. Y no pude renovarlo porque el carro está en corte suprema. I was not no. able to register my vehicle because the vehicle was under court. Okay. ¿Y el carro estaba a nombre suyo? Sí. ¿Y usted estaba pagando a la compañía? A lo, a lo, bueno, le pagué, sí. Entonces, the vehicle was mine. I was paying to the company. And you, uh, and you, and you was paying the company? Sí. Entonces, yo le estaba pagando a Coelice. How many years? Eh, ya por, eh, ahora mismo. Sí, ¿Cuántos años usted estaba pagando por el vehículo? Bueno, el contrato fue por tres años. Ya ahora yo tengo. ¿Cuántos semanal pagaba? Dos años. 375. Señor, solamente contésteme lo que yo le pregunto. No me diga nada más. Sí. ¿Cuánto pagaba semanal? 375. ¿Por, por cuántos años? Por tres. ¿Y ¿Cuánto sería eso al año? ¿Cuánto sería eso al final, Jenny? Jenny. It's over $65,000. Ok, gracias. El, el próximo. Sí, buenos días. Mi nombre es Basilio Beltré. Haz ese micrófono para allá. Para allá. Okay, para allá. Mi nombre es Basilio Beltré. Good morning, my name is Basilio. Yo cogí un carro fiado en, en Tower. Me lo dieron a tres años y medio. I also had a vehicle on Tower Leasing Company for three and a half years. Yo pagaba 4.25 semanal por el carro. I was paying 425 per week. Cuando finalicé de pagar el carro, me ofrecieron un seguro pagando 2.75 a la semana que venía. After I finished paying off the vehicle, I was offered a 275 dollar payment for the insurance of the vehicle. Que venía siendo 900 dólares al mes. Which is 900 dollars per month. Entonces, yo pude poner mi seguro y y ellos necesitan que yo le dé mil dólares por el título. I was, 
I was able to get insurance under my name, and they are offering, they're telling me I have to pay $1,000 in order to obtain the vehicle. Después, uh, I'm sorry, in order to obtain the title. Después que yo pagué mi vehículo. Muchas After gracias. I paid off my vehicle. Thank you. How much was you paying weekly? ¿Cuánto usted estaba pagando semanalmente? $425. For how many years? ¿Por cuántos años? Tres años y medio. Three and a half years. How much was that at the, at the end? El vehículo no se, lo, no se lo han dado a usted. Está bajo mi nombre, pero hay que pagar mil dólares por el título. I have to pay $1,000 in order to obtain the title. So after you pay $66,000 for the vehicle, then you have to pay $1,000 for the title? Después que usted le ha pagado $66,000, usted tiene que pagarle $1,000 por el título. Exacto. Yes. Tengo todo mi comprobante de, de, de pago. I have all my documents of payments I made. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. How about now? Okay. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Bridget Felix. Um, I leased a car from Tower Auto Finance, Tower Leasing. Um, I've had issues um, trying to keep the car. I was hit by an SUV and I wasn't able to work for two months. My payments fell through and uh, they towed my car and they actually have my car now. When I go back, now that I can lift my right leg to be able to drive, I would like my car back, but I was told that it was sold to someone else. I would like... But the car was in your name? Yes. And, and it was sold to someone else? Yes. Did you sign? I did not sign to sell it to someone else, no. How much did you pay for the car? Roughly, I should have already a year and a half's worth is about $30,000. The car is probably worth 24. Um, so I'm willing to pay the extra year if I could just get it back. Um, so what was suggested to me was to, why don't you just jump into another three year lease? <clears throat> I'd like to see if something changes here to be able to obtain, if not my car, at least another car that I can just finish paying for the rest of the year and have my title and my car, my plate, that I cannot get another plate within the next year to continue working and, and eating. Thank you. You're welcome. Sí, buenas tardes, Reverendo Díaz y sus acompañantes. Eh, mi nombre es Eligio Hernández. Good afternoon, Reverend Diaz and everyone else. My name is Eligio Hernández. Sí, vengo a denunciar un contrato que había hecho con Quest Libres. I also hace, have an issue with Quest Libre Leasing. Hace tres años, en el cual yo hice un lease de 550 dólares semanal por 156 semanas. I also had a contract for, ¿cuánto fue? ¿Por cuánto? How much weekly? For three years, 156 semana. How much was? ¿Cuánto te estaba pagando semana? 550. 550. 550. 550. 550. 550. 550. For how many years? For three years, three years. ¿Cuánto es hora? ¿Cuánto pagó por el carro? 90 mil y solamente 5 mil pesos, 5 mil dólares de, de, de inicial. Mm -hmm. 90,000 dólares por el carro? Más 5 mil dólares de inicial. Más 5 mil dólares de inicial. ¿Qué clase de vehículo es el vehículo suyo? ¿Qué clase de vehículo es el vehículo suyo? Yukon. Es una, es, una GMC, una GMC. Yukon. Es una GMC Yukon. 2013. 2013. 22 mil millas. 22,000 miles. Right. Bueno, el caso es que eh, después de, de tiempo estas personas han hecho irregularidades de cambios en este contrato y han, suspend, han dejado suspender el diamante en varias ocasiones. My vehicle registration was suspended. El cual me ha limitado a yo trabajar por semanas durante esos tres años y lo último que ha hecho Libre, pues Libre es 
suspender el seguro. De the uno last thing that Quest we were releasing did was suspend the insurance. Okay. Yo, 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 anyway. Gracias por su testimonio, porque lo que quiero ponerlo en récord, todas esas cositas, todos esos testimonios, que ustedes van a mi oficina y lo dicen, pero aquí a mí quiero, lo tengo en récord. Perfecto. Y le quiero ponerlo en récord para hacer lo que tenemos que hacer. So, yo le agradezco a cada uno de ustedes esta oportunidad, caballero. Sí, mi, nom bueno, mi nombre es Mario Marte. Good morning, my name is Mario Marte. Yo hice un contrato con Quest Libre Releasing. I also made a contract with Quest Libre Releasing. Con un carro de mm, 2014, 130 semanas. With a vehicle, 2014, 130 uh -huh. weeks. Por 400 dólares semanal. 400 dólares per week. Yo le pagué mi carro. Okay. Okay. You, you got to go on the okay. press, go ahead and, and take care of those business, go on and, and interview those people because this, this is a racket. Okay. Cuaso tiempo. Okay. Usted está bien? Yeah. I mean, it is incredible. Está bien. It's incredible. Huh. Okay, el asunto es que yo le pagué el carro. I paid the vehicle. Después que le pague el vehículo, After I paid the vehicle, voy a allá para el título. I go to Quest Libre okay, Releasing me, for the title. Me dan el título. El título tenía dos lien o dos deudas. After I was given the title, it had two liens o sea, or two debts. Me dijo que yo podía registrar el carro así. I was told that I could register the vehicle like that. Cogí dinero prestado. I went and I borrowed money. Yo. Okay. Cuando voy a cuando voy a registrar el carro, hago el seguro, el diamante. When I go to register. Y ahí voy a a a, a motorvehículo a registrar el carro. I go to the Cuando voy allá me dicen que no puedo registrar el carro. When I get there, they tell me I cannot register the vehicle. Porque el carro tiene dos deudas. Because the vehicle had two liens, two debts. With the West Liberty Leasing. Al carro in which they had towards the vehicle. But that was, el carro era suyo. El carro era de ellos porque estaba a nombre de ellos. O sea, usted lo estaba pagando cuánto Yo semanal? Yo estaba pagando a ellos con opción a que el carro iba a ser mío. ¿Cuánto semanal? ¿Cuánto semanal? 130 semanas. 130 semanas, ¿cuánto dinero semanal? 400 dólares a la semana. 400 dólares a la semana. ¿De qué año era el carro? 14. De 2014. Sí, señor. Y cuando usted fue el carro... El carro tenía dos deudas, dos lien, como dice, yo no sé decirlo en inglés, dos lien, o sea, lo, lo, lo tenían endeudado. Right. Y, y no, perdí, o sea, y, y no pude hacer nada con el carro. I was okay. not able to do nothing o sea, with the vehicle. Dos años y medio y me quedé sin nada. We are, we are in the city of New York uh, where we brag about how much we help and how much we care about the immigrants and how much we do to protect people. But the mayor has to take action, and the city council, and the speaker, and we all have to take action because this kind of abuses, this kind of exploitation to immigrants and to people that are decently trying to earn their living, we have to put an end to this. And I'm calling on the mayor and on the city and the speaker to, to start an investigation to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas Muchas gracias a ustedes por esta oportunidad. Andrea Greenbrand. Andrea Greenbrand. Okay. Oh, Andre, Andre, Andrew, Andrew. No, Andrew, Andrew, okay. Nina Gosashi. Nina Gosashi, okay. Barry Napat. Barry Napat and Caroline Prot.
Caroline. I respectfully request, Mr. Chairman, three minutes, because as medallion owners, we have the largest stake in this industry, relatively and absolutely. What do you say? All right, I'll talk fast. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Pratz, one of 6,000 individual, largely immigrant, although not in my case, working class taxi medallion owners. We're often ignored. We've been standing on the steps of City Hall for four summers, probably you've seen us. We've been to memorial services, marched across bridges, and been to hearings testifying about our plight. To your credit and the credit of Speaker Johnson and the mayor, we see that you're aware of our issues and you would like to affect change. But first, it is imperative that we all understand how this debacle of declining medallion values happened in order to better inform future actions that might help alleviate the damage that has occurred. We're not workers. We're not drivers. We're small business people. We're essentially shareholders in an enterprise that was created by New York City government. There is no free market. We already bought the franchise. In our view, there can be no remedy if the remedy and the implementation are left up to the current TLC regime, which is comprised of Bloomberg leftovers. I'm sure we all remember when Mayor Bloomberg swore to destroy your effing industry. This destruction, as promised, was carried out by his appointees at the TLC, which has become essentially an arm of a multinational corporation. Can that possibly be in keeping with the progressive path that New York City has chosen to follow? In the past, the TLC understood that medallion cabs had a protected access to market, which was often touted by TLC commissioners. For decades, the TLC promoted the medallion to first-generation immigrants as a path to a worry-free retirement and our exclusive right to cruise the streets to find passengers. What happened to change the status quo? Beginning in 2011, the TLC began ignoring, bending, breaking, and changing its own rules. These actions and inactions resulted in a much diminished role for the city franchise, yellow cabs, and a greatly expanded one for app cars. I have a detailed list. It's far too long to go into, but the main thing they ignored was their duty to protect the economic stability of licensees, which Mira Joshi never wants to talk about. She's always down in the weeds, so far that I need a machete to get out of there, but she never sees the forest, which is the fact that there's 140,000 vehicles on the road. None of these guys can make a living with that many cars on the road, and it's the one issue she never wants to address, even though she has broad authority. She allowed unlimited numbers of additional black cars, 90,000 at last count, she allowed misclassification of the app cars, which in the opinion of many should have been classified as liveries and would have then been subject to environmental review. How many air quality alerts did we have this summer? It was happening almost every day. She allowed the cars to work with virtual meters, even though they should not have been allowed to do that. She's ignored distracted driving and the 640% increase in black car crashes, 640%. She changed the retirement rules for black cars. She changed the rules on dispatching. She allowed the app companies to write their own rules on wheelchair accessibility. How did this happen? The TLC took upon itself a change in its ideology. The only parameters they work within are consumer protection, safety, driver welfare, and accessibility. They feel they have no role beyond that. Carly. It appears to us that the TLC's goal is de facto Carly. deregulation. We got to go. I, I, we I, need a TLC that will properly oh, you give time? Thank you. Yeah, I give Carolyn my time. Okay, Carolyn, go ahead, Carolyn. He give you your time. This industry will become a free-for-all with no respect given to the franchise holders' rights. Until there is a TLC that will properly do its job, which does include, and maybe you don't want to hear this, limiting the number of vehicles on the road and enforcing a protected access to the market, that was bought and paid for by medallion owner drivers. There will be no stability in medallion prices, and New York City will suffer from all of the negative externalities that go along. <coughs> Diminution of driver income, discouragement of the use of public transportation, billions of dollars of losses to taxpayers, congestion, pollution, crashes. This debacle still can be remedied. It didn't happen all at once. Our demise has been a long, slow-moving series of events. 
The combination of unlimited for hire vehicles along with new or changed rules or overlooked rules, which we can go over any time you want to have a meeting with me, I have a list this long, created an avalanche, one snowflake at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, 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 Sir? I, go ahead. I gave him my turn. I think I got my own. Good morning, Chairman Diaz and members of the Committee on For Hire Vehicles. I have submitted more detailed written testimony and uh, would just like to make three points on intro 1052. Um, my name is Andrew Greenblatt and I'm the founder and president of IDG Benefits Fund. It's a new nonprofit founded last year to help nearly 100,000 black car drivers in New York State gain access to benefits. Uh, my first my first um, point is that drivers desperately need these benefits. In polling and focus groups of black car drivers, we've learned that many drivers barely make it from week to week and often can't find ways to cope with not having enough money. This makes it impossible for drivers to prepare for the sudden financial shocks traditional benefits usually help with. My second point is that the system that is proposed in this legislation can work to solve this problem. The New York State Black Car Fund uses a similar model for workers' compensation. IDG Benefits Fund is now working with them to offer drivers free vision and telemedicine benefits as well. Finally, in order to work effectively, the TLC will need to work with trusted and experienced organizations that have worked with drivers. There are many challenges to providing benefits to drivers, including finding providers willing to work with this unorthodox risk pool, educating and enrolling drivers, and helping them use these benefits. Language, cultural, and technical challenges abound. To address these issues, we work with the Independent Drivers Guild, the Black Car Front, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, marketing companies, technology companies, and labor-friendly benefits providers. Only by working with a team of people who understand this population and how to deliver benefits to them have we been able to sign up thousands of drivers in just two months since rolling out these new vision and telemedicine benefits. I thank the speaker, the bill's sponsors, and this committee for recognizing the need for drivers' benefits, and we will gladly offer our expertise to help make sure this program is a success. Thank you, sir. We have we have about 25 more to go, 10, 25 or 30 more to go, and we have to give everyone the opportunity to get their two minutes. Uh, this is what's next. Good morning, Chair Diaz and members of the Committee on Four Hired Vehicles. My name is Eric Rothman, the President of the Driver Opportunity Service Association, or DOSA. DOSA is a membership organization dedicated to providing short-term rental of vehicles to drivers in the four hire industry. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on 1070. There are a number of factors that differentiate short-term rentals from lease or lease-to-own arrangements. Leases lock drivers into multi-year contracts, often with high interest rates, leaving them with depreciated assets. Rentals, however, are designed to provide drivers with flexibility. Our agreements are typically one or two weeks in duration, renewable at the driver's option. This allows drivers to switch between vehicles, sizes, and models to find the vehicle that meets their needs. It also gives them the flexibility to take time off or to leave the industry without the burden of ongoing lease payments. <coughs> Unlike leasing, the short-term rental model provides drivers with a set, of, a set price, eliminating the need for financing and preventing unexpected costs throughout the term of the agreement. The rental, agree the rental company retains responsibility for preventative maintenance, mechanical repairs, liability and collision insurance, TLC and admission inspections, and other costs. If the vehicle has a mechanical failure or is in an accident, a replacement vehicle is provided. This minimizes the out-of-pocket cost of the driver and allows them to spend more time working collecting fares. DOSA members support the Council's efforts to increase transparency and consumer protection in the FHV, leasing, and short-term rental markets. These are practices that DOSA members already implement, but many companies unfortunately do not. We commend the Council for mandating them throughout the industry, protecting drivers and maintaining a fair marketplace. 
requiring that all companies disclose all fees and provide all protections will ensure that drivers can properly evaluate the full cost of renting a vehicle and shop around to find the most competitive price. However, we have concerns about the unintended consequences of placing price caps on the rental market. Unlike FHB leasing, short-term rental companies are responsible for oil changes, insurance, and other costs. The price of rentals must be able to accommodate fluctuations in the economy to account for these items. If we cannot afford to maintain a fleet, we will not be able to provide this service and the necessary flexibility to drivers. DOSA members look forward to working with the Council to increase protections for drivers and maintain a competitive and fair marketplace for the FHP licensed vehicles. Thank you right, for your time. Thank you. My name is Nina Godashi. I'm a yellow cab driver for 10 years. I'm driving a yellow cab for 10 years in New York City. What, what we see today, everybody we see, it's a disaster outside on the streets of New York City. And it's everybody's, they live in this city, the life is in danger. So we, you pass the bill, but you need to enforce. You need to reduce the cars they run the city every day. It's out too many, out the control. The life, everybody's life, it's in danger. The, another thing you need to do, the Uber cars, they have to go in inspection like the yellow cab drivers we go every four months. You cannot have different rules for one and different rules for everybody. We care human beings, both cars care human beings. So we both, we have to go on the same rules. Every four months we have to go for inspection. And another thing you have to do to raise the medallion price. How are you gonna raise the medallion price? I don't have any answer today. That's why I am here today. To, uh, to raise the medallion price, first you have to stop these people to reduce the cars, the number of the cars in the city. Then they cannot charge the same price we do charge. They have to go higher by miles or a different way. We need something from you today to raise the medallion price, or if the city cannot do it, you should reimburse the yellow cab because we work really hard in this city for those medallions. You destroyed, city is responsible, you destroyed our families. That's why you need to, someone need to take responsibilities or make, this is disaster like the Sandy disaster on, in 2012, this is Uber disaster for our families. That's why the city has to pay us back or take, or take uh, the medallions back and let us to go because we are like in jail today. We cannot go nowhere. So you have to do something. We need a solution now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm calling Hector Herman. Who's this? Alice. Who's that? Alice. Arkin Brown. Jin Shen Lin. Henry Chen. Henry Chen, Henry Chen, Henry Chen, thank you. He was here, he was here but he's no longer here. <laughs> Raskin Manigold, Raskin Manigold, okay. Guillermo Founder, Guillermo Fondu, Fondu, Guillermo Fondu. No? Okay. Thank you very much. Let's go. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Héctor Leonardo Germán, cariñosamente en el mundo choferil como One to Two. Good morning. My name is Héctor Germán, known by One to Two. En nombre de la comunidad taxista, nosotros queremos saludar a ese prestigioso nuevo comité que ha venido en busca de la vicisitud de, de la comunidad taxista, empezando of, por on el. On behalf of the, com of the community 
cab drivers, I give thanks to the council and to the members. Especialmente queremos saludar a Reverendo Rubén Díaz y a los demás miembros que integran el Comité for Her Vehículo o FHB. Nosotros, al igual que los compañeros que pasaron por aquí testificando lo que le pasó, we as we we as the other colleagues that came through here testifying. También nosotros fuimos víctima de esos negocios turbios que tienen la mayoría, por qué no decir, de esos negocios llamados leasing. Also, we were victims of those turbulent companies in which they are the leasing companies. Pero aparte de todo lo que nos pasó a nosotros, al igual que a los compañeros que ya dieron su testimonio, nosotros estamos aquí en nombre de la comunidad taxista primero. We are here on behalf of the, comp of the taxi driver's company first. Queremos que, señor Díaz, usted con el nuevo comité y todas las autoridades. Mr. Díaz and the rest of the members of the community and all the other authority. Vayan e intervengan inmediatamente en lo que son la confesión de esos contratos abusivos que tienen estos negocios. Es bueno que ustedes sepan que estos negocios hacen una, inve una inversión de alrededor de unos 25 mil a 28 mil dólares durante tres, durante tres años, donde el compañero taxista termina pagando de 54 mil a 60 mil dólares. Un carro totalmente devaluado. A vehicle that has lost the value. Porque cuando usted decide Primero, eh, buscar el, 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 el título de ese carro en su mayoría. Tal y como denunciaron los compañeros anteriores, just like the previous colleagues mentioned, el título no aparece. The title does not appear. O tienen deuda con, Or they have debts, con banco, liens, como está ocurriendo actualmente en muchos de, de esos leasing. Like it's happening actually in a lot of these leasing companies. En, nosotros queremos que esos contratos contract, el chofer tenga una integración sea parte directa de ese contrato de los leases por ejemplo nosotros entendemos que cuando hay un accidente y ese accident, carro es declarado pérdida total, total loss, en este momento los leases se aferran del contrato moment, y el compañero taxista Aún siendo en la semana final, the driver, no consigue week, absolutamente nada porque ellos toman el contrato en la mano y dicen que esa all, es la ley. Por lo tanto, nosotros le solicitamos al nuevo comité y a todos ustedes to to que dentro de ese contrato contract, deben okay. haber cláusula directa okay. donde el taxista... Ya el tiempo se terminó. Lleva más de tres minutos ya. Más. Ok, gracias. Thank you. Gracias por el, gracias por el tiempo, caballero. ¿Quién va aquí? ¿Quién sigue? Muy buenas tardes, Comité de Transporte de la Ciudad de Nueva York. Mi nombre es Guillermo Fonder. Estoy aquí en representación. Good afternoon, Community of Transportation. My name is Guillermo. Estoy aquí en representación de la comunidad de choferes de la ciudad de Nueva York. I'm here in representation of the community taxi, taxi drivers of New York. Mi, mi llamado básicamente para el comité de transporte de la ciudad es que, is to the transportation of the city. que siempre tengamos pendiente que todos los choferes tenemos nuestra familia que depende, family, que depende de nosotros y us, todo el estrés que los choferes están recibiendo todas las horas, the the hours, todas las horas que debe el chofer permanecer en la calle sin compartir, compartir con, con sus hijos. Es un, pro, es un grave problema que, va, que estamos creando. It's a serious problem that we are creating. 
a largo tiempo. At a long term. Y un chofer con problema manejando en la calle es and una bomba de with problems driving in the streets. Es una bomba de tiempo. It's a time bomb. So it's no solamente el problema para el chofer o para la familia, sino todos los la persona que anda en la It's not only a problem for the drivers, the family members, but everyone that's out in the road. Que también anda en las calles y el y el problema que el chofer sufre the problem that the driver suffers por la renta, por el bajo salario que recibe, por la falta de low wages, seguro de salud, lack of insurance, health insurance. En general, in general, todas las los los estrés uh, que reciben stress, es un problema que va a causar es un problema grave para la ciudadanía. It's a, it's a serious problem that we're having. Y yo les solto a todas las partes involucradas en este problema que antes de tomar una decisión I imply to all the parts that are involved in this before you take a decision que no piensen en el color que trabaja el chofer, el amarillo, verde, negro, azul. Do not base azul. your decision on the color of the vehicle that the driver is driving. No importa, tomen en cuenta la vida del chofer, okay. que es la vida de los driver. ciudadanos de la ciudad de okay. Nueva York. Gracias. Good morning. I have owned my medallions for over 20 years. In spite of being a single mother, I took over and dedicated myself to prosperity, which I did accomplish all by myself. I didn't even know how to drive at the time, but I took lessons and threw myself completely into trying to make a success in a very tough business. Eventually, I was able to turn the corner and breathe easier until the city of New York and the TLC allowed a rich corporate giant to invade this industry with no entry fee and none of the same regulations that I must comply with every day. Anyone with brains and foresight could have predicted the disaster that would follow an uninterrupted flow of FHVs into New York City and the total collapse of the value of the taxi medallion. All of this under the less than watchful eyes of Mira Joshi and the TLC regulators. Because of this adversity, I am working the taxi again. I don't want to, but we know the story. Intro 1061 is a bill that proposes to understand how to deal with the collapse of the value of the taxi medallion. A good idea in theory, but in practice, can we expect the regulatory in agency under its present leadership to undertake this task with any honesty and integrity? After having gone through what I have gone through and seen what I have seen from the TLC, I urge the city council to open your eyes and to get rid of your blind faith in the very folks who sat back while my fellow medallion owners committed suicide. Mira Joshi took no responsibility for the suicide epidemic and actually uh, called it a mental problem. These were not crazy people who took their lives. They were people who were driven to desperation. We medallion owners applaud the actions of the city council in August, but we want to use this hearing to sound out a warning flare. All of our good work will be wasted unless the TLC and not the credit union okay. is placed under receivership because its leadership is morally and practically bankrupt. However, if new management isn't put in place, you're going to have to find a way to hold the regulators' feet to the fire. If we don't move, <clears throat> if we don't, more people will die and more hardworking women and men will have their dreams and lives destroyed. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> okay. Uh, hi guys, my name is J uh, Jackie. Um, I'm at, when I first started driving for Uber, I was a student, uh, and during that time, of course, as any uh, any college student, they you know they got no money. So what we what do we do? We signed up with Uber. We went to uh, one of their leasing companies or rental companies. 
uh, when I first started driving, it was okay. You know, for someone who's first making a little bit of money for themselves, I was like, oh, this is great. But then after working for a while, I found out there's a lot of hidden costs. Um, and what didn't help at all was the cost of the rental fees. Huh? Oh, yeah, but the cost of the rental fees. Um, every In a month, I was paying about uh, 1800 a month, and that's not including gas. Uh, and as you know, gas price is also going up. Um, and as a college student, it was, I had a hard time uh, figuring out a schedule to make some money for myself, study and be, uh, do well in school, and pay my student loans. Um, and that's not including my rent to where I, for where I live, and also uh, food to feed myself. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, before that. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, before that, so I was wondering, um, not wondering, but I was hoping you guys will pass the bill for fair leasing prices, because if the lease prices go up, I'll be homeless, I will be uh, not able to afford the car, and I'll be jobless as well. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is uh, Rashid Manigault. I represent uh, Uber drivers and uh, IDG, Independent Drivers Guild. I'm a driver myself, and um, I'm, I've been driving for three years without benefits, and you know it's just getting harder every day to you know to do this job, you know without benefits. Uh, um, so I know what a lot of drivers are going through. Um, if they get sick, if they have kids, you know, if they have a family and um, they can't drive, like say, you know, they get a broken leg and they can't drive, they're going to be out of money. They're not going to be able to pay their rent. And um, we just need, we need benefits. I mean, I don't have any kind of health benefits, so I'm just doing this thing, you know, super independent. So, you know, we can definitely get that on the table, definitely benefits for uh, all the independent drivers. You know, I greatly appreciate that, thanks. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Henry Chen. I'm one of the organizers with the Independent Driver Guild. We are representing all the gig economy app-based drivers uh, in the university. I think it's very important, first thing, to cap on the the, the rental. Why? Because our biggest expense is on the rental. And the TOC started, the rental only cost $100 a week. I think the message is very clear. The rental is 400 500 or 600 The driver, any driver cannot bear this. And this cause will lead to the suicide that's committed in the past few months. Whether it's a yellow cab driver, uh, a base uh, drivers, they can be the suicide, and we do, we do want to prevent this tragedy from happening. And one thing to prevent that is solve the fundamental issue of financial crisis of all the drivers. $2,000 payout just for the rental? How fair do you think it is? I would like to be a proud resident of New York City. I would like to one day travel the world and say I am the proud citizens of New York City, a city which make a miracle happen, a city which make a justice happen. And, and also, I also want to talk about the benefit. The driver needs a benefit, needs a retirement plan, needs something to back out when they work in long hours, 14, 15 hours on the road, and when, when they come back to their house, in front of their house, they are shaking my hand. There was one day I walked 14 days street, and then I, uh, 14 hour street, I arrive in front of my house and then I feel my body is shaking. And that shouldn't be a, 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 the fair, how like a, a fair a city should treat its worker. And I, I don't think that's right. And the benefit is really important and we have to make sure we have the fresh water because every driver knows right here, when you go out, you don't have the fresh water and you don't have the bathroom, a clean bathroom, just to provide a dignity, the respect for all the workers in the New York cities. And okay. we have to fight for <clears throat> okay. more bathroom and you know, such you. fundamental needs of hum uh, humanity. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you. I have, we have 21 more to go. So, thank you for all of you and thank you. And please be sure that we be nice with the other people that have to talk because they have patiently have been waiting too. Michelle Tot Michelle what? Dotin? Michelle Dotin? Michelle. Uh, Tina Rabinu. Asis Ba. Asis Ba. Osman Chouri. Osman Osman Chouri. Se fue. La Min Ba. La Min Ba. Abraham Loeb, Loeb, okay. Two minutes each. Good morning, um, Ruben Diaz and council. Um, I'm here today basically to talk about what the leasing and rental um, fees have, have done to our drivers. Um, with the Independent Drivers Guild, I sit in the office and I can't tell you how many drivers come in in crisis. We sit and we counsel them because of the cost. The cost of one rental could be 500, one rental could be 450, one rental could be 600. What's happened since you've done since they've done this uh, vehicle cap is that rental companies are now starting to lock out drivers. If they are $50 outside of payment, they lock the vehicles and then they tow it. And then when they tow it, they put the, rent, the fees onto the drivers. My neighbor who drove and got $1,000 in order to get his car back on the road because he was $50 short of having his payment. We have drivers who come in and just look at us and say, what do I do now and how do I feed my family? How often do we talk these drivers off the ledge? But it's not about just drivers pitting us one against the other, whether we're yellow or green or black. The fact is we did something now and it's now created another crisis. And if we don't put a reasonable price to that leasing company where it should be about 350. There's no reason for these leasing companies to charge these drivers these astronomical fees. And let alone what we've just done with the wave vehicles, now they've added an extra $200 if you want to wave rental vehicles. What are we going to do to stop this? And we definitely need to have the health crisis done also. Too many drivers don't have medical Good evening. My name is Tina Ravino. I am an IDG member, a full-time driver for the two major app-based companies, and I'm also a single mother. A few months ago, I sat here and I pled my struggles to this council. I would like to acknowledge your tremendous effort to respond and to make this industry better for all drivers. But today I sit here and to let you know I have sat. We need fair leasing. My leasing fees is $1,700 a month. My rent is $1,200 a month, plus childcare, plus food, plus utilities, and my vehicle expenses. If my son is sick for one day, one day or even half a day, I'm already lost my weekly payment and I've fallen behind. I ventured into a retail company after our last bill signing. To my surprise, I was so happy, you know? I'm like, okay, now I could afford a wave vehicle. What did I walk into? Average fee, $800 a week. This is what I make. This is, Bill is like literally sending me into a shelter. 
$800 a week to rent, okay? I walked away. I ventured to lease a vehicle or make a purchase on a way vehicle. And those prices were tremendously higher. Either way, I'm failing. Either way, I'm sinking. Please, this council needs to listen. Thank you. Um, my name is Aziz Ba, and um, I am a driver and a member of the uh, Independent Driving Guild. And uh, in respect to uh, intro 1070, actually that's long overdue. Um, predatory lending been uh, been rampant and been excessive for years, and um, uh, at the wake of the vehicle cap, it's like giving these guys free reign and say, "Go ahead, charge whatever you want," because that bill should have definitely come with certain restriction. Because as you know, a simple Toyota Camry that normally goes for twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars at the end of the day, you go trying to rent that same vehicle, it's gonna end up costing you to the tunes of eighty thousand dollars. That just don't make any sense. And uh, that been going on for a very long time. So this is a big issue. And what made it what makes it worse actually is the fact that there's no money to be made on the streets. You know, prices are very, very low, and that's something we uh, totally need to address. You know, because um, uh, we, we've asked for a raise, and uh, finally you guys gave us a 22.5 raise based on uh, a study that stay, that's show our, um, our expense being at $20,000 a year, which is totally flaw. And I just want to touch on real quickly um, on uh, intro, intro 1052. Um, which uh, actually address uh, health care for drivers. That's something we desperately need. We need actually, you know, some basic health care. I think that's, uh, that's something everybody should have. And we're not, we just don't need a safety net. Give us more money. Allow us to make more money working. And that will stop most suicide that you've seen. These people start committing those suicides, not because they had mental issues, but just because they could not make a living. That's the issue. Allow us to make a decent living, plain and simple. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Lamin Ba. I'm an independent driver. Uh, I'm right here to talk about the lease. It's very important. I lease a car like three years and a half. When you come to the company to lease, they never tell you the amount or the final result you have to pay. They tell you, they ask you the choice. They give you two choice. First, they say it's a two payment, 500 and 425. The 500 go to three years and a half. The 400, uh, the, f the 425 go to three, th three years. Then give you a choice. So like me, I choose the three years and a half. I was paying 425 for two years. Third years, they was pushing me. Oh, you didn't make a payment, you didn't make a payment. You later payment. I was going through to 500. Finally, I paid 500. The car come final result when I finished paying the car, it come to $78,000. No, sorry, $86,000. I'm a family man, I have five children. Sometimes I don't even have revenue, I don't have nothing on me to feed my family. So those things have to stop. We come on you to help us, help our community, help drivers to, to stop on those things. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Abraham Lobe. Uh, I'm also uh, a driver. Uh, I work with the uh, New York Taxi Worker Alliance. Uh, my story is a similar story, but the difference is that uh, I entered into a lease agreement with a company called American Lease in the Bronx. Uh, halfway through the contract, uh, they defaulted and they literally uh, changed the language of the contract by making it impossible for me to continue to work. 
uh, three weeks. The car didn't have insurance, didn't have diamond, and uh, they kind of uh, took back the car, and I worked during those three weeks just to maintain a living. And after a while, I continued working. They brought back the car. They told me to come and get the car. And when I came to get the car, they make me sign another contract. They extended the payment, and I ended up paying more than $78,000. And while I was working, it was hard for me not only to make a living. Uh, at one point in time, I even became homeless, and I almost gave up. Uh, some friends encouraged me to go back driving yellow cab. So I was driving yellow cab to pay for this car, not to lose it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you say something today. Those companies need to be prosecuted. We need a serious investigation. We need to put an end into this by giving the TLC power and an independent commission to work with the TLC because the TLC, they cannot help us. So I'm here, uh, Chairman, to tell you that we support your bill, I support your bill. May God bless you, sir. Thank you. I, I, I just want to let all of you know that my office is open seven, uh, five days a week from nine to five. And there is an office attended by Jenny here. Yeah. And before you sign anything or you have any problem using the TLC have been unjust to you or whatever, come to us, the office, from any part of the city. Doesn't matter, you don't have to be from my district. From any part of the city, you could come and you could talk to Jenny. Right. Okay, that's okay. the office there for you guys oh, to help you to see if we could, what we could do to alleviate uh, all this burden. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask all of you to bear with me. I'm 75 years old, and I got to go to the restroom for two minutes. So, so bear with me.
Thank you. I apologize, but I had to go. Uh, we call him Muhammad Tipu Sultan. Muhammad? Muhammad? No good? Okay. M MDS Islam? Islam? Bahai Anatoly? Salifo Haliru? How many was that? One, two, three, four. Ruth Lowenkron? Ruth Lowenkron? <coughs> Ruth? No good? No Ruth? Nikolai Hint? Nikolai Hint? That's you? Okay. One more, no, one more. Vero Lanza. Okay. Oh. Remember two minutes each, each. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Robin Diaz. You passed the bill that cap the app based car. It was a great that we have a floor, we can stand, and we can fight back for the driver's right. And today, we come for a couple of bills, but I'll talk about, about the benefit, especially. Driver need the benefit. Driver need the social safety net. For example, the driver, Muhammad Hassan, he was in 28th Street and Lexington last Sunday, standing with me. He said that he may go very badly sick. And he have a family, and he driving a yellow cab. And this is the situation. Not only Muhammad Hussain, there is a hundreds of driver, thousands of driver on the line of broken health. They don't have any, uh, uh, there are so many drivers don't have a health insurance even. If you go to a driver, wherever they hang out, you can see their face, you can see their health, and it will be the clear message to you. Mr. Robin Diaz, in your area, thousands of taxi drivers are from Bangladesh. You have a right there, all evidence to prove driver need a social safety net. 2012, New York Taxi Worker Airlines was fighting for the uh, health and benefit bill, and we passed it. And 2014, there is a court say that it cannot, it should not be, and we lose it. And 2014, we lose it. 2018, we need it. 2015, we, we lose the cap. And 2018, we, we get it. And look, taxi worker airlines always think first. And they know since 1996, taxi driver, all the driver need how, how the benefit, they need the income, they need the livable income, everything. So I'm a proud member of the New York Taxi Worker Alliance as a driver, and thank you so much for bringing this bill, and we want this bill to be passed, and we need some amendment, as Boyd be the shy New York Taxi Worker Alliance mentioned it. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, MD Islam, and I'm driving for Uber, and I'm the member of uh, Taxi Workers Alliance of New York City. I'm here to say uh, about my experience in Uber driving with a uh, car to, uh, lease to own car. I went to Tower 2014 and I took the car from there for three, three, uh, $369 for 186 week. And I paid, I ended up with uh, $69,000. That's 2014 Toyota Camry SE. The car worth is about $26,000. And I paid everything by last uh, April. And <coughs> from April to until now, I couldn't hook up that car to 
Uber because the car I left it behind my friend garage because I don't have money to buy uh, $2,000. I, I couldn't afford that money to buy it. And the title, like TLC fee and registration. So I don't know how to put the car, and, and, and there is a cap on the TLC, I mean the cars, so I don't know what I'm gonna do, but still now I'm rent, renting another car from my friends for $400. So that's all. Talk to her. Sure, sir. Okay, sure. so we finished. Be sure you talk to her. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Anatolo Bai. I used to drive a Euro cab before for 18 years. Now I'm Uber driver from, you know, from 2014. I leased the car from American Lease for three years in the half, 182 weeks. They told me my payment gonna be like a 425 week. So every week I pay like a 425. I end to pay the car like for eighty three thousand dollars. The pay they fix the car. Me I fix the car. When the car broke down, I fix the car. Change the oil. I change the oil. The tire. Repair is me. I got to pay the rent. I'm a family man, four children. End of the day, end of the week, I know about nothing. So, also, for no benefits, for no insurance, if I'm sick, nothing. So the city council has to do something about for the, you know, for benefit for the for all the driver. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Ali Rosalif. I've been working for Uber three and a half years ago. So I went to the Uber, they sent me to American Lease. From there, I signed a contract for 182 weeks. So every week I pay 425. So by the, by the end of my lease, I end up paying $84,514 for Toyota Siena. So now, after the lease, they asked me if I'm gonna be on the insurance. The insurance cost eight hundred dollars. I said no, I cannot stay on your insurance. He said, okay, if you cannot stay on our insurance, we have to take the plate, and then you go find your insurance. And before that, I find the insurance where I can I will pay three hundred nine dollars. So unfortunately, by the time I finish the lease, they vote the bill to put the cap. So now I cannot have a license on my name. So I had to stay with them. I had to, I had to, I had to stay with them and paying $800 instead of $300. All right. To, to all of you, to all of you, we have an office, especially dedicated only for, for, for to, to solve <coughs> the problem of taxi drivers. So come to my office, no, no matter where you live in the city. It's not, it doesn't have to be for my district. As long as you're a taxi driver, you have to deal with TLC, we might be able to help you. We cannot help everyone. We, cannot, we, are, we will not be successful 100%, but we will try and we will help you. So come to my office. Yes, what is it? Okay, thank you. So. Good afternoon. My name is Nikolai Hand. I have been driving a taxi for over 30 years. We are here today because we have common, common cause that was established in August by the city council and the mayor. 
That is public safety, regulatory, fairness, and clean environment. Right now, we have more than 100,000, uh, 130,000 cars on the streets of New York. Not a single sector can make a decent living. It, this year, it got so bad, six of the fellow uh, cab drivers and medallion owners killed themselves. One of that person was my best friend, Nikanor Okishor. He drove a taxi for more than 20 years, and he was about to retire about almost 65 years of age. When I come to this country, I knew if I was going to work hard, I'll be able to succeed. That's why in 1990, after I drive, drive the taxi since 1988, I did buy a medallion, taxi medallion, yellow taxi medallion. What I didn't count at the time, the city officials and the Taxi Limousine Commission will, ab will abandon me and their system what they create, taxi medallion system. Here, I will mention the rules which everybody wants to ignore and not to mention. 52-04-A4. This has to be respected. This is in the book. What we're going to do now? We have so many cars. We have to get control of these cars, which are in the streets. The only way to get control on these cars to have some kind of system which was introduced in 207 into yellow taxi medallion, so you can have control at any time, any day. Many, many uh, cases with, uh, with the Uber, they did not release the data without the court order to the New York Police Department. This has to be stopped. You want to go forward? We have to implement this control. Okay. Without the control, we have no safety and no public safety. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. My name is Vito Lanza. Oh. The oh. The I started driving a taxi May 4th, 1978. First five years, I worked for a taxi company to save money to buy a medallion. Sometimes I had to get up before 5 o'clock in the morning to go to a company so a taxi would be available. Um, in order to own a taxi, they, yeah, I had to buy a medallion. And they said, if you have a medallion, you have the exclusive rights to pick up people in the city. Um, Bloomberg changed the law. First, he started with the green cars. The green cars were needed in the other boroughs, but they didn't compensate us for stealing the value of our business. He just changed the law so they could come in for free, just like he changed the law for his term limits so he gets three terms, and he went from four billion to 32 billion, manipulating his power, giving tax breaks to corporations so he could steal money for himself. Um, the TLC sold medallions for a million fifty thousand dollars. Now they say they're overinflated prices. The only justice for us, for me, that have been working over 40 years, and I'm. 62 years old now, is to be compensated for the robbery that they've done to me. They allowed 83,000 to come in for free car services. That's like giving them $83 billion for nothing. Then they also included Suburbans and Mercedes-Benz to make my car look inferior with the money that they save for not having to buy medallions. Uh, you know, we are the sacrificial lambs. They made so many people benefit by robbing us. And how, and, and Bloomberg invested billion dollars in Uber and Lyft, and how much did they make coming in for free? And with all the money that they made, that they have 83,000, they can't compensate a, a, yet less than 14,000 owners or 6,000 individual medallion owners. They can't compensate them for having $83 billion for nothing, and then, and then the luxury cars that they sell to make our cars look inferior. Why can't they pay for something? Why do they have to rob us and they're not accountable for anything, and they're self-entitled crooks and murderers. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make. The Senior Citizen Committee is supposed to meet here at 1 o'clock. They are kicking me out already. <laughs> They're telling me that I got to move out. I know some of you are here since 10 o'clock waiting to speak, but we got to move this thing. Or, or, or they're gonna come, they're gonna, they already telling me you gotta get out. So I'm not the boss here, I'm just 
a Pepsi. Thank you very much. So I, got, I have seven more to go. I don't know if you would like to go fast or if you're going to come, you got to do it fast because the senior citizen committee is waiting. The chairman, the chairperson is here telling me get out. And I'm a member of that committee too. I got I got I have to stay here for that committee too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Musa, Mr. Diop, 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 Musa Diop, uh, Kimberly Wright, Tamara Vigianokova, uh, Ramon Sanders, Golan Taluk Talukner, Aaron Jones. I'm going to call all of you finish now. Nicole Epstein and Mohammed Mabu. That's it. Okay. And we finish with that. Sir? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Musa Job, and I'm working for a taxi limousine car service about 15 <coughs> years ago. And my topic want to be only on the, on the loan because we have a problem for the, not only for the leasing, but we have a problem also for the financial companies, for the bankies. They took us a lot of interest on, on, this, on this case because they aren't profited. And, uh, if I give the example about uh, three years rent, uh, leasing the car on the bank financial, you can pay the double of, you, of the, car, the value of the car. And after the three years, the car also is going to lose the value. And some companies on the limousine car, car service, they also tell you on to go change the, another car because the car is not, cannot be on the, on, on the road because they have a lot of mileage or the car is a little bit defected. This also you have to take intention about it and uh, help the people to, 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 to regulate for the, for the bank payment on, on these on this cases because the loan is very high, the rate is very high and uh, is only basic for the, for the immigrant people. And this one is uh, something you have to take care about it and we, need, we hope so uh, to, take, to, take, to take a lot of things about the, the loan, financial loan, the rent, the leasing to, to be very really hired for, for the people because if something you cannot be living on this situation. And uh, I hope so you taking a lot of things also to be on this bill to, to, to regulate about the, the bankies and the, on, it's not only for the people renting and, but only all the bank also have a part on the responsibility of this living for the drivers. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, committee council. M my name is Kimberly Wright, and I currently lease my vehicle for $450 a week. And that is equal to $450 times five is $2,500 a month. And if I just do four weeks, that's equal to $1,800. Yes, yes. So I am around, I make around $550. This leaves me only a hundred dollars. After I pay my lease vehicle, I am asking the city council to cap the lease price at least three hundred and fifty dollars in order for me to survive as a FHV driver. Okay. And also, with the help of the independent driver Gould, who heard my pe pain on pricing, I'm here today to not let their herd work in vain. <laughs> thank you, sir. Hi, thank you, Chairman. My name is Nicole Epstein. I'm with Gotham Government Relations. 
And, you know, I just want to take a second to discuss something that hasn't been brought up yet, which is let's think about these Uber car partner dealerships. Clearly bad actors, I think it's fair to say. So what type of quality car, you know, does everyone think they're getting? Okay, there's passenger safety issues here. Simple Yelp reviews. I mean, there's hundreds of them. I don't know how maybe the TLC hasn't, you know, taken a look at it yet, but for example, here we go, here's one. I had to take my car back, and yesterday I was almost involved in a car accident because the brakes did not work. I had a customer in my car, okay? And the vehicle is no longer starting. I have only had this vehicle for two days. Okay. When you want to see the cars they show you, the car is on the parking lot, and they say to you, oh yeah, if you like those that look regular, but then the one I received was in horrible condition, okay? Here's another one more. They are quick to take your money and give you a dirty, broken down car. Okay, so the TLC commissioner not only is totally ignoring the fact that these people are paying the price of a Lamborghini rental, okay, either if it's Elisa own or rental short term, they're both equally as bad. They're forcing them to pay this money and then totally not even thinking about passenger safety, most importantly. So I don't know if the TLC commissioner has any duties, but I can't see any that have been enforced or followed up upon because it seems like everything's out of whack here. And I also testified the same exact thing exactly a year ago to the date. Same thing I just said now, and no one had the reaction that you had today. And so um, thank you so much for listening. And one more thing, j just so you know, Uber does, basically they're like garnishing wages because they're taking the payments out from the rental agreements, basically saying, yes, you must work for us. But then, we, you know, the commissioner wants to talk about cross-dispatching and choice. You have things like this going on that's been overlooked, so. Maybe one of these days when you have a little time, you go come to the Bronx and meet with me. Yep. Uh, with Jenny. Uh, we would like, like to talk to you to see what we would to, to do together, sir. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Commissioner. Um, I'm going to reiterate what has been said previously by many drivers and, and owners. Um, for example, my pay and my pay out. My pay out for my, for my finances, 700 a month, $400 a month for insurance, $340 a month for health insurance, $300 a week for gas. Sir. I'm sorry, your microphone is off. It's off? Say your name again. Give me my time back. Say your please. name. Give me my time back, please. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? All right. My financing is 700. My insurance is four. 340 for health. 300 for gas. This is a week for gas. 1,000 for my rent. $400 for my utilities. $300 for food and $300 and more for repairs. Um, this is for one that can afford financing. For those that cannot afford financing and has to lease, this is like $4,340 a month for payout. <coughs> I'm bringing in a little bit above that, maybe 48, sometimes five. I am so stressed out where I refuse to go to work every day now. I used to work six days a week. Before the, the, before the, the regulations, it was seven days a week I worked. Now I'm working three, four days a week because I am so stressed, don't want to work, can't make no money. I have to watch my back with the passengers. If I press my brake hard, I'm being written up. I have so much stress that it's hard to go to work. So I'm making less money. I had over $30,000 in my bank Two years ago, now I'm down to 4,000. I'm living off my bank account, and I'm afraid that I'm going to have to soon get Medicaid and food stamps and have somebody pay my rent through the government system. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm I'm here as one of the 6,000 taxi owners that saw an opportunity to invest in a city franchise that promised financial stability. We paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for, pu for, pu for publicly protected city franchise that would guarantee our future. 
the city of New York betrayed us. In a space of a very short time, we lost everything. We lost our investment, we lost our retirement, we lost our income, <clears throat> with no time to start from scratch. What was a well-regulated and well-established public conveyance that has existed for 86 years had been mutilated. Thousands of us, small business owners, need our investment protected with fair regulation. We are here to testify on it intra 1069. The idea is worthwhile, but how can you give the authority to examine this problem to the very agency that contributed to said problem? One crucial step is necessary. Put the TLC under the new management, the new management that is willing to control the newcomers as tightly as they control us, yellow taxi. As part of the new deal, all Ubers and Lyft need to be connected to a central TLC computer. Without this connection, the agency cannot make rules that will truly enact the legislation that this council has created, especially intra 838, that can reduce the number of vehicles so that everybody can earn a living. We are grateful that the council leadership has taken some very bold steps, but your work has just begun. Your legislation will slowly decay if it's left to the current TLC to implement its provision. Please don't put our faith in Mara Josh's hands. Thank you. The last one. Good afternoon, <coughs> Chair Diaz and committee members. My name is Aaron Jones, and I'm a policy analyst for SEIU Local 32BJ. On behalf of our 85,000 New York City members, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today and for your efforts thus far in driving reform in this industry. Our members work in residential buildings, commercial spaces, airports, and major arenas in the city. Every day, our members work side by side with taxi and app-based drivers. Countless rides start and end with the help of a 32BJ member. We're proud to stand with our brothers and sisters who drive for a living, and we're pleased to issue you support for this important package of bills. Collectively, they'll help to end some of the most financially exploitive practices in the industry, promote a fair and accessible experience for passengers, and empower drivers to better understand and control the financial risks present in the industry. In particular, we emphasize our support for intro 1052, 1070, and 1079. In relation to 1052, we note that we would also support alternative and complementary mechanisms to support a benefits package. New York City has been at the epicenter of the, the expansion of the FHV market. With, the, with these bills, New York will further establish itself as a global leader in setting fair and progressive rules that shape and regulate the industry's operation. On behalf of our members and the communities we share with New York's taxi and app-based drivers, I thank you again for your time and for your efforts in advancing these vital measures. Thank you, sir. To all of you, I appreciate your uh, support and attendance. This committee has one of the greatest public hearings as attending, attending, all of our hearings are well attending. And you come here in the morning and sometime, one time we were here at the three o'clock and nine o'clock. And today we have a nice hearing. So I appreciate your support to all of you. Thank you very much. And again, my office has an, has an office, my office has an office to deal with tax, with tax, with, lim with tax and limousine problems, and with the drivers from all over the city. You don't have to be from the Bronx. You don't have to be. This is the only one in the city. But uh, you don't have to live in the Bronx. You don't have to live in my district. You are, you have business with the TLC. We have an office specially dedicated to help you on that as much as we can. Sometimes we we are. Uh, um, positive and we could solve the problem sometimes we cannot but we you, that's that's your office so please come and Jenny is there and she she knows she knows and she and the TSC has opened the door and the what's the other department the the O too so 
to all of you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is... Thank you. Thank you.